again, everybody. This is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. And maybe you've seen that meme. I think a lot of people have seen that meme where I show some kind of a, uh, you know, NPC or a Wojak or something, a crying guy or whatever. And it's like, what? who radicalized you? And the, the, the gold haired, gold beard guy kind of leans over and he gets closer and he gets closer and he says, you did. And so as it's happened, it's come up a number of times in the past few weeks of my life, both in terms of recording some episodes of this podcast, the New Discourses podcast, where I covered that odd UNESCO document, uh, which I made a series reading much of that document as a podcast uh, titled The Strange Death of the University, but also in interviews that I've been in, I've been you know, interviewed several times by different people, once the BBC, some other people, and it keeps coming up. How did you get into this, James? How did you get into this? Why did you start caring so much about these academic papers? Why on earth did you write those grievance studies papers back in 2017 and 18, which we just passed the four-year anniversary of that coming out into the world? So, you know, yay. Uh, I guess the grievance studies affair gets to go to kindergarten next year. Um, maybe. Why did you do it? And you know, I keep having to talk about this feminist glaciology paper that was, I mean, there were a number of triggers that led to, you know, an increasing amount of focus on my part uh, on this subject, which we now rec- reference as woke or wokeism, or I call woke Marxism. Uh, social justice scholarship was a name that we used in cynical theories for it before that. There are a number of triggering events, if we want to use that terminology, that led me to take this degree of interest in it, but really the one that kind of tipped us over the edge into writing the conceptual penis as a social construct. Peter Boghossian and I wrote that in 2017. What finally kind of tipped us over the edge, and then that was a trigger for the Grievance Studies Affair, and that was a trigger for thinking this is an extraordinary, alarming thing that people need to know about writing cynical theories, creating new discourses, and doing everything that I do now, uh, was this feminist glaciology paper. And I keep referencing it for people, and I can't even remember what it's called. I don't, I couldn't remember the title. So I looked it up to remember the title. I remembered what what journal it was in and all of these different things, but I had forgotten what the title of the paper was. So I looked it up and then I thought, you know what, I'll just read this paper. I'm so sick of having the same dialogue where I say, well, there's this paper about feminism into the science of glaciology, which I usually say that. And then I have to tell people it's a science that studies glaciers. You mean like ice? Yes. Like ice, like I-C-E, like ice, like the thing on top of a frozen mountain, the thing in the Arctic. The thing that, you know, splits off icebergs floating into the Atlantic or the Pacific or whatever. Yes, ice, glaciers, glaciology. And I keep having to tell people, I read this paper and this was sort of a major event. And then I say this, if I told you what was in the paper, you probably wouldn't believe me. So I read this thing in 2016. And after I read it, um... This was the paper that led Peter Boghossian and I to decide to write The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct. We read an article, and I think it was in The Spectator, but I don't remember, about this paper. We were already tracking kind of goofy peer-reviewed papers. There was an account on Twitter called Real Real Peer Review that was putting out these real peer-reviewed papers that are absurd and insane. I think they covered this one. They must have covered this one. But uh, a journalist in The Spectator or something like that by the name of Matt Ridley wrote an article about this paper, about the feminist glaciology paper, and said that he holds out that it's an academic hoax that the authors are not coming clean about. This led to there being something of an inquiry at the University of Oregon where uh, where the authors were situated for this paper. And um, turns out they stood by the paper. The University of Oregon defended them. It's apparently under a fair amount of money, uh, National Science Foundation money. I will probably find what that is as we go through the entire paper. But I've heard varying reports that indicate that the grant that 
these four authors at the University of Oregon were operating on ranges anywhere from 400 and some odd thousand to 800 some odd thousand dollars of National Science Foundation money, not to write just this paper, but to do a broader research project uh, in which this paper was embedded. And let me see if I can scroll to the very bottom of this paper and find it funding. The authors disclosed receipt of the following financial support for the research authorship and public and or publication of this article. This work is based upon work supported by the United States National Science Foundation under grant number 1253779, thanks to the Geography Colloquy, Colloquium Series at Ohio State University for valuable input on this project. So let's see if we can just open that up. I should have planned this better, but I hadn't intended to talk about this, um, and find out how much that grant was for. Uh, NSF award. So here it is. Award abstract number 1253779 from the National Science Foundation, nsf.gov. Career, glaciers and glaciology, how nature, field research, and societal forces shape the earth sciences. Total intended award amount $459,452. Total amount, awarded amount to date $459,452. Funds obliged, they were spread out over the fiscal years 2013, 14, 15, and then in 17. And it is to these authors, so we are looking at just shy of half a million dollars of National Science Foundation money went to support the research project that, among other things, ended up producing this paper. Now, I keep calling it this paper, and I haven't told you the title or any of the relevant stuff, but let's just get to it. But I just really wanted to, you to understand that seeing this paper in the academic literature was the thing that made Peter and I realize it's time to hoax the academic literature. Um, this is where the Grievance Studies Affair came from. And I keep telling people, if you, and I've said this, if you go, I think if you go back to the Joe Rogan episode that we were on in 2018 talking about the fake papers, the hoax project. I think if you look back at that, you'll find us saying if we told you what was in this paper, you wouldn't believe us. So this paper, in that it had almost half a million dollars in National Science Foundation money, in that it is in a significant academic journal called Progress in Human Geography, which according to their stats right now, has an impact factor. And I know most of you won't know what this means, and I don't really want to take the time to, to explain it. So I'll just kind of summarize. An impact factor is a number that tells you how impactful a journal is, how important the journal is, um, and how, how often it's being cited specifically. And it, it, it's a number that's used by academics to determine how important a research journal is. It's one of several different measures for that. And usually numbers for the refer for, for in the impact factors for research journals aren't very high. Um, a lot of the kind of premier journals we were targeting when we were doing the Grievance Studies Affair had an impact factor of things like two. Uh, Nature, which is, I think, the biggest journal, has an impact factor of something in the 40s. But very, very few journals have an impact factor above five. Now, well, this journal currently has an impact factor of 7.2. 602 and a five-year impact factor of 9.048. This is a very considerable journal, Progress in Human Geography. It is a sage journal. And this isn't the time or place to div divert into the, the discussing that sage academic publishing was founded by Robert Maxwell, a very shady kind of guy with a new business model for publishing science. And Robert Maxwell, you think, Maxwell, that's an interesting last name. And then you realize, yeah, that is Gillian Maxwell's dad, and that's not shady at all. But at any rate, um, this is a sage journal, Progress in Human Geography, and the title of the paper is Glaciers, Gender, and Science, a Feminist Glaciology Framework for Global Environmental Change Research. It is volume 40, issue 6. It was published in July of 2016, and it was by the authors Mark Carey, M. Jackson, and that's just the letter M, not E-M, just M. Jackson, who did a TED Talk, by the way, on this subject, which you should go look up and watch. Alessandro Antonello, 
and Jacqueline Rushing. And I don't know if they're all at the University of uh, Oregon, but this is where at least I think Carey was, Mark Carey. University of Oregon, University of Oregon, University of Oregon, and University of Oregon. So yes, there. this is a University of Oregon research team, all four of them. So I'll read the, the abstract to you, and then we'll go ahead and read the article. So the abstract says, Glaciers are key icons of climate change and global environmental change. However, the relationships among gender, science, and glaciers, particularly related to epistemological questions about the production of glaciological knowledge, remain understudied. This paper thus proposes a feminist glaciology framework with four key components. One, knowledge producers. Two, gendered science and knowledge. Three, systems of scientific domination. And four, alternative representations of glaciers. Merging feminist post-colonial science studies and feminist political ecology, the feminist glaciology framework generates robust analysis of gender, power, and epistemologies in dynamic social ecological systems, thereby leading to more just and equitable science and human ice interactions. Now, if we would have been up on what was going on back in 2016 when we found this out, the idea of more just and equitable science would have caused us to poop our pants, metaphorically speaking, and we're not Joe Biden. We would have stressed out, just and equitable science is Soviet science, and that would have been just Lysenkoism. And if you remember in the, the UNESCO series, if you listen to that, The Strange Death of the University, especially in the last two episodes of, this, of that podcast, I keep talking about this paper and saying that it's representative of the Lysenkoism that's crept into the university under the name of sustainability. We would have been very concerned about this bid to study knowledge producers. In other words, who gets to be considered a scientist? gendered science and knowledge. This is going to be corrected through Soviet science and so-called knowledge. Um, Systems of scientific domination stuck out to us as particularly worrisome and hilarious. And then alternative representations of glaciers is just somewhat mysterious. But this is the paper that triggered us, if you want to use that language, and I don't care, it's funny, uh, to decide it's time to hoax gender studies, which became social justice scholarship as we progressed. The key words for this paper are feminist glaciology, which is how I refer to this paper to this day, feminist political ecology, feminist post-colonial science studies, folk glaciology, glacier impacts, and glaciers and society. Climate change somehow didn't make the list. It's not a super long paper, but let's go ahead and break it down. Actually, no, we're going to read the whole thing. I want people to hear what's in the feminist glaciology paper. I want people to hear what we saw and thought this is t- this, this field needs to be exposed. We can't argue about it. It has to be exposed. Even showing examples just got explained away. You'd show this paper and people say, yeah, but this is just a $500,000 of National Science Foundation money. The TED Talk came out of this. A TED Talk came out of this. You should watch it. You really should. M. Jackson does the TED Talk. You should watch it. Type in Feminist Glaciology M. Jackson TED Talk. See what you get. It's an amazing 15 minutes of your life, I promise. Section 1. Introduction. Glaciers are icons of global climate change, with common representations stripping them of social and cultural contexts to portray ice as simplified climate change yardsticks and thermometers. In geophysicist Henry Pollock's articulation, quote, ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates, it's not burdened by ideology and carries no political baggage as it crosses the threshold from solid to liquid. It just melts. This perspective appears consistently in public discourse from media to the International Government or sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. But the quote, ice is just ice conceptualization contrasts sharply with conclusions by researchers such as Cruikshank, 2005, who asks if glaciers listen. Orlov et al., 2008, B, who analyze 
the cultural framing of glaciers. Carey, that's one of the authors of this paper as well, 2007, who sees an endangered species narrative applied to glaciers. Jackson, 2015, that's M. Jackson, one should assume without checking, who exposes how glaciers are depicted as ruins. And Serlin, 2015, who refers to the present as a cryo-historical moment because, quote, ice has become historical. That is, that ice is an element of change and thus something that can be considered part of society and of societal concern. Now, let me pause here. Ice has become historical. When I read this in 2016 or early 17, there was no way I understood what that meant. Because I, was, I studied something useful. I studied mathematics. I, didn't, I studied science. I did not study horseshit political economy. In other words, I did not study Karl Marx. Ice has become historical means it's something that can be studied according to the scientific study of history. It means it's something that can be understood in terms of all of its myriad social causes. So the state of glaciers becomes wrapped up in the story of history as it unfolds. In other words, the story of mankind. And so man has had this impact on ice, so ice tells part of the story of man, the causes that have affect ice, or affected ice throughout man's history have also been the causes that have shaped mankind and will continue to do so. So forward-looking, or in the present even, ice is a historical object. Why? Because it measures the impact that man is having, or so they claim. In some dimension, it's measuring the impact that man is having on his natural environment and also through the same modes of production upon himself. In other words, this is saying that ice has become historical, this is saying that this is generally a Marxist flavor or Hegelian dialectical reading of history about ice and glaciers, which was completely mysterious to me, completely opaque to me at the time. Nusser, they tell us, Nusser and Boghul, I don't know if I'm saying those names right, and I honestly don't care, 2014, also reject the, quote, ice is just ice assertion. Glaciers, they argue, quote, have increasingly become contested and controversial objects of knowledge, susceptible to cultural framings as both dangerous and endangered landscapes, end quote. Glaciers, after all, affect people worldwide by influencing sea level, providing water for drinking and agriculture, generating hydroelectric energy from glacier runoff triggering natural disasters, yielding rich climate data from ice cores, shaping religious beliefs and cultural values, constituting identities, inspiring art and literature, and driving tourist economies that affect local populations and travelers alike. Okay, so that's a lot of interesting stuff, none of which is technically false, but none of which is glaciology. And that's kind of what we have to remember here, because the goal here is going to be to move horseshit into glaciology. Not any horseshit, but social theory horseshit that these people control, because when they move it into glaciology, they then control glaciology. When they control glaciology, they then control some other institution. And their goal is to control all the institutions to reproduce their narrative and to move the ball along for their political agendas. And that's what you have to understand. Despite their perceived remoteness, glaciers are central sites, often contested and multifaceted, experiencing the effects of global change where science, policy, knowledge, and society interact in dynamic social ecological systems. Again, if you've been following the recent podcasts, you see this sense. They, they're not doing it explicitly, but you see this in World Economic Forum documents. You see this in United Nations documents. You see this in this paper. You see this in the UNESCO document. You see this appeal to complexity. There's this greater world of complexity than the science of glaciology can possibly communicate. And because there's this greater complexity, people like us need to be put in control of how it's researched. That's the, that's the trick. That's the sneaky little move they make. Oh, no, no, no. You think you know lots about glaciers. There's so much more about glaciers. You don't understand. It's so much more complicated. It's uh, con often contested and multifaceted. It's where science policy, knowledge, and science, policy, knowledge, and society interact in dynamic social ecological systems. 
you need somebody who understands dynamic social ecological systems. Not just ecological systems, but ecological systems that interact with human social environments. You need social scientists to come in and weigh in on how glaciology is going to be done. This is why I kept referencing this paper when I was talking about the strange death of science in the UNESCO podcasts, which are, again, the series is called The Strange Death of the University. This paper was, in a sense, a canary in that coal mine, and people weren't listening. Today, they tell us there's a need for a much more profound analysis of societies living in and engaging with mountains and cold regions, including the social, economic, political, cultural, epistemological, and religious aspects of glaciers. Now, surely you're at this point thinking, there's no way PhDs wrote this. This is nonsense. I don't disagree. A critical but overlooked aspect of the human dimensions of glaciers and global change research is the relationship between gender and glaciers. And now you're thinking, what? Or I am. The relationship between gender and glaciers. Okay. Can't do feminism if you can't shoehorn gender into it, right? And the goal is to get the feminism shoehorned into glaciology because then the feminists, can, who are very politically active, can control a science. While there has, and remember, this is glaciology. This is, a, this is a science that has particular ramifications for the global control project under the, the, the auspices of climate change. So you can, you can start to see the move into the levers. While there has been relatively little research on gender and global environmental change in general, and it cites some nice feminists, there is even less from a feminist perspective that focuses on gender, understood here not as a male-female binary, but as a range of personal and social possibilities, and also on power, justice, inequality, and knowledge production in the context of ice, glacier change, and glaciology. Then it lists a handful of exceptions that I'm sure are just charming reads, some of which were already cited. Feminist theories and critical epistemologies. Uh-oh. Feminist theories and critical epistemologies, especially feminist political ecology and feminist post-colonial science studies, open up new perspectives and analyses of the history of glaciological knowledge. Researchers in feminist political ecology and feminist geography, and they give some examples, uh, I don't recognize immediately any of the names, have also called for studies to move, quote, beyond gender, to include analyses of power, justice, and knowledge production, as well as to, quote, unsettle and challenge dominant assumptions that are often embedded in Eurocentric knowledges. That means go woke. All that means is go woke. Beyond gender, gender is not enough. Got to go woke. How? Analyses of power, justice, and knowledge production. If you've listened to my Ferrari podcast, you understand that methods of knowledge production, but besides Ferrari, also the postmodernist, but are really at the heart of what the project that became woke is. You have all this critical Marxism, then you have these analyses of knowledge and meaning making being done in a Marxist and analytical way by Freire and the postmodernists getting brought back into the critical, Mar the stalled critical Marxist project, and that's what enabled woke to advance. So this question of power justice and knowledge production means go woke. For what purpose? To unsettle and challenge dominant assumptions that are often embedded in, oh, here's the, the scapegoated bad guy, Eurocentric knowledges. That mostly means, in this case, science like actually knowing what the hell you're talking about, which might matter if you're trying to study glaciers and, say, have the an interest in actually knowing what you're talking about. Given the prominent place of glaciers, both within the social imaginary of climate change and in global environmental change research, a feminist approach has important present-day relevance for understanding the dynamic relationship between people and ice, what Nusser and Baghel refer to as the cryoscape. So just make up a fake name for this interaction space where humans and ice interact, and not by putting it in their whiskey, and you have a cryoscape. You just make up a fake name for it, and then you have a place that you're the only experts who know how to talk about it. You guys don't even know there's a cryoscape. We've been mapping out the cryoscape for a long time. What is a cryoscape? Well, it's about the dynamic relationship between people and ice and where and how that takes place. Total nonsense. Total word games to justify, like, cryoscape? Wow, that sounds high-tech. 
It's not high tech. It's applying sociological horseshit to ice. Through a review and synthesis of a multidisciplinary and wide-ranging literature on human ice relations, this paper produces a feminist glaciology framework to analyze human glacier dynamics, glacier narratives and discourse, and claims to credibility and authority of glaciological knowledge through the lens of feminist studies. Now, you, again, you re- recall how many times in the last few podcasts, or many podcasts, or different things I've put out on new discourses, I've made the point that the claim is for them to usurp the mantle of credibility and authority, to take it away from the people who currently have it because they have robust research methodologies, and to put it in the hands of the party apparatus that has the correct ideology. Why? Because if we go back to Hegel, Vernunft, which is the correct party ideology, is superior to Verstand, which is understanding, which is the low-level understanding of scientists. In other words, the ideology is actually more correct and more important and trumps the low-level understanding that occurs by actually studying nature. This is the actual inversion of science that Hegel called science. And that's where kind of all of his uh, crack pottery leads. And remember that Hegel's ideas informed Marx, and Marx's ideas informed these idiots um, through however many links in a chain, sometimes direct, sometimes many uh, in between. But that's the goal. The goal is to usurp credibility and authority of glaciological knowledge by using the lens of feminist studies to criticize existing glaciological knowledge and knowledge production methods and epistemologies. That's what this is about. This is a power grab over who gets to produce knowledge, who gets to be considered credible and authoritative. And the people who understand that inclusion and equity and sustainability are king are the people who absolutely deserve more than anybody else to be considered credible and authoritative. And people who don't realize that extra complexity, that extra level of understanding, that frenumft understanding, those poor people don't have what it takes to really know what's going on. They have understanding of glaciers, but they don't have reason about glaciers. If we translate uh, translate um, Hegel's words directly, or if we uh, were to translate them kind of more literally, they have science of glaciers, but they don't have gnosis about glaciers. Because that's actually what Hegel was referring to with those terms. And gnosis means special revealed wisdom, a glimpse of the divine intellect. And that's what they believe that they have. As a point of de- where in the lens of feminist studies, as a point of departure, we use quote glaciology in an encompassing sense that exceeds the immediate scientific meanings of the label. So they have to blur the boundaries and expand the meaning of glaciology to do what they want to do. Much as the feminist critiques of geography, for example, have expanded what it is that quote geography might mean, vis-a-vis geographic knowledge. Okay, so they expanded the definition of geography, right, to feminist geography. Now, you'll remember, if, since we're talking about the grieving studies affair here, that the dog park paper, the fake dog sex paper, human reactions to queer performativity and uh, rape culture in dog parks in Portland, Oregon, urban dog parks in Portland, Oregon, the fake dog sex paper that we wrote, that was considered an exemplary study in feminist geography. So they expanded feminist geography to be, or geography in the terms of feminist geography be so broad that examining dogs humping each other in dog parks such that we can learn something about the way that humans rape each other, and thus we can learn to train men the way that we train dogs in order to overcome rape culture, to, 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 to take on rape from a feminist perspective, is a geographical knowledge because they've expanded the meaning of geographical knowledge to make it feminist, and this is what they want to do to glaciology. They're saying that the limited term glaciology needs to be expanded, and that's what they're actually doing. They're just going to use the word in this new expanded way that means more than what it actually means, which means it's going to be confusing, except to them, the initiate class that knows what's going on. So they say as such, feminist glaciology has four aspects. One, knowledge producers to decipher how gender affects the individuals producing glacier-related knowledges. Okay, so there's no first thing that the it is four things: knowledge producers, gendered science and knowledge, systems of scientific domination, and alternative representations. Just so we can list all four, but they say knowledge producers 
Feminist glaciology includes a study of who gets to decipher. Who gets to decipher what knowledge is going to be produced in terms of glaciers. Two, gendered science and knowledge to address how glacier science, perceptions, and claims to credibility are gendered. This is how they're going to wedge feminist analysis into uh, the idea. They're going to say that the science of glaciology or science in general is gendered. It excludes women or trans or whatever else, and therefore has to be remade to include those people preferentially under inclusion, which means actually excluding the old and including the Soviet. Uh, that's literally what inclusion boils down to, including that which has been marginalized and moving out of the center, that which had not been marginalized, which was previously centered, as they phrase it. So gendered science and knowledge to address how glacier science, perceptions, and claims to credibility are gendered, which is their essential argument, ultimately. Three, systems of scientific domination, that's how they're going to justify it, to analyze how power, domination, colonialism, and control undergirded by and coincident with masculinist ideologies have shaped glacier-related sciences and knowledges over time. This is just feminism through a Marxist framing, uh, going after systems of scientific domination, so it's going after science. And four, alternative representations to illustrate diverse methods and ways beyond the natural sciences and including what we refer to as quote, quote, folk glaciologies to portray glaciers and integrate counter narratives into broader conceptions of the cryosphere. That sounds all very um, scientific and technical, but really what it means is that they're going to bring in alternative knowledges and consider them equal or superior to existing knowledges, which are one limited way of seeing things and thus usurp credibility and authority over a science that has excluded their methods for legitimate reasons, not illegitimate reasons. Now, I'm just going to point out as a matter of being a pedant that um, they're now calling it the cryosphere and they called it the cryoscape less than a page ago. These four components of feminist glaciology not only help to critically uncover the under-examined history of glaciological knowledge and glacier-related sciences prominent in today's climate change discussions, the framework also has important implications for understanding vulnerability, adaptation, and resilience, all central themes in global environmental change research and decision-making that have lacked such robust analysis of epistemologies and knowledge production. Two, why feminist glaciology? See, it's not self-evident that any such thing is needed, so they have to explain it. In fact, it's self-evident why such a thing is not needed, because it's a feminist ideology, ideological drive, glaciology, science, attempts to minimize bias, so you don't add in a political bias to something that's attempting to minimize bias, but that's exactly their logic. And that's what they're going to argue is that, well, the bias is already there. So if we don't add our bias, haha, <laughs> it's going to be biased the wrong way. We have to level the playing field. That's the essential argument every single time. This bad thing that we want to do is already happening, but you just don't realize it. We're doing it consciously, so we're doing it more responsibly. You're doing it unconsciously. You don't even know you're doing it. And so you're doing all this harm without even realizing it. That's their essential argument every freaking time. This time's no exception. So why feminist glaciology? Feminist glaciology, they tell us, asks how knowledge related to glaciers is produced, circulated, and gains credibility and authority across time and space. All right, let's pause real quick and point out what feminist glaciology doesn't do. Glaciology. It doesn't do science of glaciers. It doesn't ask anything about glaciers, actually. It doesn't study glaciers at all. It asks how knowledge related to glaciers is produced, circulated, and gains credibility and authority. Why? So they can take charge of that credibility and authority. Because if they understand how it gains credibility and authority, they can find the weak spots in that system and exploit those to take over the credibility and authority and usurp it in a different direction. Very early in, in the, the trajectory of New Discourses, I actually put this together before New Discourses officially launched. I figured this out in December of 2019, and I didn't say anything. New discourses started in February of 2020, and I didn't say anything about it until sometime that summer because I wanted to figure out how to develop it and take more time with it. 
But I said with a science of glaciology or physics or mathematics or chemistry or biology that they always do the same thing. They go after the sociology and anthropology around that field first. What's the departmental situation? How do the, the, how does a glaciology department at a university work? What are glaciology conferences like? What's the anthropological history? What was the science of glaciology like as a social phenomenon throughout its history. So they're going to go after the sociology and anthropology of a discipline first. They're going to try to seize control of the means of production of the sociological circumstances around a field. Then they will use that as a justification to change the field. The logic is pretty simple. There's problems in the sociology. There have always been problems in the anthropology. There must be something wrong in the social dynamic around the field, so we need to control it. Once they control it, they can then extend the question, and this is where the Lysenkoism comes in, they can extend the question and say, well, if these problems are endemic to the social, the social circumstances around a field, maybe the field somehow itself, the knowledge, etc., the methods, etc., are producing this culture, this community. So maybe the field itself has to be rethought and brought in line with the ideology. And the best way to do that is to make sure that only ideologically conforming, only woke, only Soviet uh, scientists are allowed the to, to do research in this field from now on. So we're going to start in the name of inclusion. We're going to start including more of us for diversity and excluding more of the people who actually do the rigorous science and the brand name of inclusion in order to do that. And if you don't like what they're doing, then you're not making an environment where they feel like they belong. And so you're going to be pressured more and more and more until they colonize the entire social architecture and then use that to say that the field itself has to be rethought and the science itself, what results are published, what questions are asked, what questions are answered, how are they answered, what gets published, all has to be brought in line with the Soviet ideology that's taking over. That's what's happening here. And feminist, here's the confession, but four or five years ago when I read this, I had no, five years ago, five years ago I read this, I had no capacity to understand what I was reading. Feminist glaciology asks how knowledge related to glaciers is produced, circulated, and gains credibility and authority across time and space. It simultaneously brings to the forefront glacier knowledge that has been marginalized or deemed, quote, outside of traditional glaciology. That's what I was saying. You'd have to take the marginalized stuff and move it to the center, and to make room for it, you have to take the stuff at the center and move it out toward the margins which is an inversion of, in this case, traditional glaciology. It's an inversion of whatever they try to transform. The marginal stuff, which will include a lot of stuff that they dredge up people's sympathies for and much more activism, which has been excluded because it's explicitly the opposite of science, is going to get moved into the center of what the science does. In other words, they're going to Sovietize the science. The name for that when they Sovietize a science is Lysenkoism following in the, the, the footsteps of Trofim Lysenko, the Soviet agriculturalist who had his crazy Soviet agriculture and biology programs that straight up starved 40 million people, maybe uh, 30 to 40 million people, depending on how you want to count them, because you had to use the Soviet, not the capitalist bourgeois agriculture. That's what this is. They moved the marginal knowledge to the center and excluded, moved outside, out from the center, real knowledge. And that's what they're going to do with traditional glaciology. Every time you hear decolonizing the curriculum, that's what this is. That's a big part. It's not the whole thing of what is happening there. It asks feminist glaciology. It asks how glaciers came to be meaningful and significant. Again, they don't ask questions about glaciers. They don't give a rat's ass about glaciers. They don't know anything about glaciers. These people are dumbasses. They don't know anything about glaciers. They just know they want to control glaciology. So they go after meaning-making, sociology and meaning-making. It asks how glaciers came to be meaningful and significant through what ontological and epistemological processes. That makes it sound smart, but that's just horseshit. In other words, what it is is the ability to take out the underlying ontological and epistemological assumptions undergirding the sciences, which we might call an enlightenment philosophy, so that they can replace them with Marx's conception of man in the world, which is a transformative one. As well as trying to de... Sorry, I'll do the whole sentence. It asks how glaciers came to be meaningful and significant, as well as trying to destabilize underlying assumptions about ice and environment through the dismantling of a host of boundaries and binaries. That's a bunch of vague talk 
that does exactly what I just said. That's being really vague about their actual intentions and sounding smart while they do it. The feminist lens is like, listen to those freaking words. Destabilize underlying assumptions about ice. Like what? That it's fucking frozen water? Like, what are you talking about? And environment through the dismantling, disrupt and dismantle, disrupt and dismantle, destabilize and dismantle in this case, through the dismantling of a host of boundaries and binaries. A host of boundaries and binaries is what you're going to dismantle? Like what? That's super vague, guys. But when it's vague, they can say something really horrific without anybody necessarily catching on that they're saying something really horrific. Like a boundary. I don't know, keeping bullshit out of science. There's a boundary that your method is not rigorous. There's a boundary that you turn out to be a fraud and not a scientist. There's a boundary. They want to dismantle those boundaries. Binaries, like what? Scientist, not scientist. Science, not science. Actual study, political horseshit. Those are binaries. They want to dismantle those. They want to blur everything out. Why? So they can move in, so they can reform the ontological and epistemological assumptions out of the Enlightenment uh, frame that we have taken for granted throughout the modern era and replace it with its largest modern era competitor, which is the Marxian transformative frame, which derives from Hegelian alchemy, which is in fact literally a blend of hermeticism, which is wizardry, and Gnosticism, which is like the most pitiful heretical religion in the history of mankind to blend Gnosticism. It's, it's believing that you have secret insight into the mind of God and they're therefore entitled to order everything. I'm like, holy shit, it's the most narcissistic thing in the universe. But that's what this is really about. The feminist lens is crucial because that's where that mindset lives without sounding like it's what it actually is. They can hide it between behind being, oh, good for women. The feminist lens is crucial given the historical marginalization of women. See, there's a lever that's anthropological. The importance of gender in glacier-related knowledges, that's fake. That's just fake. Contrary to what this paper is going to say later, you'll hear, glaciers don't have genders. Glaciers are just ice. They really are just ice. I mean, sometimes there's rocks, I guess, but they're just ice. The importance of gender in glacier-related knowledges. Fake. Okay, so again, the feminist lens is crucial given the historical marginalization of women. So there's your lever, there's your anthropology of the field is effed up, so we have to bring in something different. The importance of uh, gender in glacier-related knowledges. Fake. And the ways in which systems of colonialism, imperialism, and patriarchy co-constituted gendered science. In other words, that it came, that it's anthropology again, came from a bad place. Now remember here, because it says, given the historical marginalization of women. Remember, I did a short podcast for New Discourses Bullets a while back. It's very important. It's like four minutes long. It's very important. The historical marginalization never goes away. No matter how well women could be exalted to the top pinnacle of the entire universe forever forward. And it doesn't change the fact that there was historical marginalization. So they can always claim, always, no matter how much power they extract, no matter how much privilege they have, no matter how much advantage they're granted through their fraudulent system, they can always claim women were historically marginalized because that's always true. In history, they were. In the past, maybe not now, it doesn't matter. It's historical marginalization. So that becomes a infinite milking cash cow. They can just, and as long as, we'll, we'll switch metaphors, as long as that golden egg keeps laying, or sorry, that golden goose keeps laying eggs, as long as that golden goose of historical marginalization is something people give a shit about, thinking it means something important, that we have to do something politically actionable in the now to compensate for something in the past, as long as that golden goose keeps laying eggs, they get to keep stealing power. And they can do it forever. They can have 99.99999% of the power and not 100% and can still get the next decimal point worth of power out of the same, the next golden egg this, this stupid golden goose lays. I'm telling you, it doesn't go away. Additionally, the feminist perspective seeks to uncover and embrace marginalized knowledges. No, it doesn't. It seeks to empower itself. 
using marginalized knowledges like feminism, which is a political activist program and not knowledge, and indigenous superstitions because there's a massive like pity point they can press there. The feminist perspective seeks to uncover and embrace marginalized knowledges. It should say use and alternative narratives. Yeah, because they have to forward alternative narratives. Remember when the feminists got all mad when when Trump was saying we have alternative facts? <laughs> um well, the feminist perspective seeks to uncover and embrace marginalized knowledges and alternative narratives, which are increasingly needed, they don't say why, for effective global environmental change research, including glaciology. Now, what I would say is there is a reason why. It's because global environmental change research, including glaciology, is overwhelmingly a power grab. And feminism is a great tool for grabbing power. That's why it's crucial to effective global environmental change research, because global environmental change research isn't actually about environmental change on the global scale. It's about affecting a power grab, a political power grab. And the crucial feminist piece can't be excluded, although it can now because this was written way back in 2016, six years ago or five years ago, or I guess six years ago. Holy shit, time flies. This was written six years ago. And as it was written six years ago, uh, the trans phenomenon hadn't destroyed feminism yet. And so feminism was still crucial. Feminism is only crucial now when nobody's looking too hard because this paper technically is super transphobic all the way through. Uh, they tried to hide it by saying that they don't mean gender like a male, female binary, but it's all about women. So what is a woman? Of course, a combination of feminist and post-colonial science studies and feminist political ecological, or sorry, political ecology provide the intellectual foundation for feminist glaciology. So what is feminist political ecology? Political ecology. Hmm. So this is like where Marx uses the word political economy, which is actually a way of pretending you're talking about economics, but you're actually talking about politics. And that's what this is. You're going to pretend that there is an ecological universe of political forces and that they need feminist perspectives to weigh in on that ecology. So if you think of it as an actual ecological system, they need to come in and poison the system so that they're in control of it. It's like an invasive species coming in and taking over an environment. Most existing glaciological research, they tell us, guess where this is going? And hence, discourse and discussions about cryospheric change, I guess the cryoscape is out and we're in the cryosphere now, stems from information produced by men about men with manly characteristics. Uh, ice. And within masculinist discourses. I guess like cold plunges or something? These characteristics apply to scientific disciplines beyond glaciology. There is an explicit need to uncover the role of women in the history of science and technology, while also exposing processes for excluding women from science and technology. Yeah, that's the typical crying game that they play, isn't it? Let's see. Harding, 2009, this is Sandra Harding, who created the concept of strong objectivity. So, you know... We say that we're trying to be objective when we try to understand something as it really is, right? Well, she said that that's not possible. So what you actually have to do is inject feminist bias, feminist standpoint theory, to understand the thing from the feminist perspective, which gives you strong objectivity, which is better than regular objectivity. So thinking about a thing from a feminist perspective is a stronger form of objectivity than regular objectivity, which she says doesn't exist. That's Sandra Harding. She's also famous for having said that Newton's Principia Mathematica was a rape manual, which she got made fun of so viciously for that that she had to walk it back and apologize for saying it, believe it or not. But she actually tried to say that Newton's book about physics and calculus that he wrote in like the 1500s was a rape manual for raping nature because it taught us so much about how to interact with nature and take control of uh, natural processes to our advantage or whatever. I'm not kidding. So Harding, 2009, explains that the absence of women in science critically shapes, quote, the selection of scientific problems, hypotheses to be tested, what constituted relevant data to be, uh, what constituted, how must me need to be constitutes relevant data to be collected, and how it was collected and interpreted, the dissemination and consequences of the res results of research, and who was credited with the scientific and technological work. Okay. 
So this is what I'm saying is they go after the sociology and they say, well, if your sociology is wrong, you're probably doing your field wrong. And then they, after they take advantage of that to gain power, to get in, then they'll flip it over and they say, well, if the sociology is wrong, the field itself that informs the sociology is probably wrong. We better change that too. And how are you going to do it? By having new people, political operatives, political officers, in the guise of feminism in this case, selecting scientific problems, choosing which hypotheses will be tested, deciding which data is relevant for collection, deciding how it will be collected and interpreted, and how it's going to be disseminated uh, and, and communicated, and thus, at the end, who gets credit, which is going to be them. This is the Sovietization of a science. Scientific studies themselves can also be gendered, apparently. What can't, of course. Scientific studies themselves, they tell us, can also be gendered, especially when credibility is attributed to research produced through typically masculinist activities or manly characteristics such as heroism, risk, conquests, strength, self-sufficiency, and exploration. So there's your list of manly things for the week. The tendency to exclude women and emphasize masculinity thus has far-reaching effects on science and knowledge, including glaciology and glacier-related knowledges. See, because men are doing it and men are being manly, they're making the science wrong. So we need feminists to come in and fix everything because that's worked out literally zero times. Feminist glaciology is rooted in and combines both feminist science studies and post-colonial science studies to meaningfully shift present-day glacier and ice sciences. They want to shift the sciences. While feminist science studies focuses explicitly on gender and the place or absence of women in science, it can neglect specific analyses of the social relations of colonialism and imperialism, emphasizing instead Western women without sustained attention to indigenous, non-Western, and local knowledge systems that are the centerpiece of post-colonial science studies, again citing Sandra Harding in this case. The post-colonial perspective is crucial for understanding, or the post-colonial perspective is crucial for them not getting called racist, but anyway, the post-colonial perspective is crucial for understanding glaciological knowledges because the science of glaciology has historically participated in the imperialist, colonial, and capitalist projects associated with polar exploration, mountain colonization, resource extraction, and Cold War and other geopolitical endeavors. So, Bad thing was happening in the past, we'll say. Bad thing was happening in the past. This was devised within that context to some degree. Therefore, what's happening today retains the vestiges of that problem. So we need feminist political operatives to come in and transform the thing into something different. That's the argument. It's nonsense. As if the field couldn't have come down to robust scientific methodologies even if it started in a bad, bad way or bad place in the first place, or those things were even relevant. More recently, glaciology has also, and this is another point here actually, that's, that's very subtle but very important. What they're saying is that the purpose of a scientific study intrinsically shapes its results. So if you were to engage in a study of ice for two different reasons that you would end up, if you were a true scientist and you had two different reasons for studying the ice, and you found the same conclusion, you would draw the same conclusion. What they're saying is that's not true. The political motivation somehow magically taints what's going on and takes it in particular directions, etc. More so, they need to put theirs in and get the other out. They have to take the marginal system and move it to the center and decentralize the central system so that they can occupy the center. Why? Because that's where the power is. From the center is where you can see the totality and the particulars, but from the margins you can only see the particulars because it's Hegelian dialectical alchemy, which is really a means of power grabbing. More recently, glaciology has also been central to Earth systems science that often relies on remote sensing from satellite imagery to suggest broader claims of objectivity, but is actually akin to the, quote, God trick of seeing everything from nowhere, citing again Donna, no, sorry, not again. This is different. Citing Donna Haraway at this point. It's a different feminist, not Sandra Harding. Okay, so that's a really funny thing to say, but they're saying, uh, they're saying that glacier science relies on remote sensing from satellites, 
which is akin to looking down on earth from God's perspective, the God trick of seeing everything from nowhere, the God's eye view from nowhere, it's sometimes phrased, which doesn't exist, they claim. So there's no such thing as objectivity, but the, the, the satellite pretends to be objective by giving you the image that God would have looking down on the earth if God, I guess, was located 100 miles above earth's surface in orbit. Sensing everything, seeing everything, sorry, from nowhere. The God trick. They're so poetic. Questions about epistemology and climate science. What, what, is, what is seeing everything from nowhere, by the way? that You don't see everything from nowhere. You see everything from the center. You see the whole and you see the, what they're saying ultimately is that only people who have the gnosis who understand how the whole and the particulars are actually part and parcel of the same thing, how they co-constitute one another. Only those people can actually see more of the whole picture. So other people pretend that they can be objective and they can see everything, but from nowhere. But they know that it's only in the center that you get any claim on that, but only the Gnostics, the only the enlightened can see the whole and the particulars and understand them as part and parcel of the same thing. Now that's literally, again, Hegelian dialectics or hermetic alchemy. Questions about epistemology and climate science, ice coring, and glaciology are only beginning to be asked, especially focusing on Cold War polar glaciology. Lots of citations on that. Of these, studies probing the discipline of glaciology, only a tiny subset and analyze gender, yeah, because it's irrelevant, or approach human glacier interactions from the perspective of feminist post-colonial science studies or feminist political ecology. Holy shit. Could you imagine that? Of these studies probing the discipline of glaciology, they're saying the problem is only a tiny subset analyze gender or approach human glacier interactions from the perspective of feminist post-colonial science studies or feminist political ecology. Fewer still recognize indigenous knowledges, local perspectives, or alternative narratives of glaciers. We used to call those things superstitions. Even though large populations of non-Western and indigenous peoples in it inhabit mountain and cold regions near glaciers and possess important knowledge about cryoscapes. Oh, we're back to cryoscapes and out of the cryosphere. Maybe they're different. I don't know. Feminist and postcolonial theories enrich and complement each other by making sure that feminists don't get called racist. Whoops. By showing how gender and colonial colonialism are co-constituted, as well as how both women and indigenous peoples have been marginalized historically. Mm, yeah, so I was right. Feminist glaciology builds from feminist postcolonial science studies, analyzing not only gender dynamics and situated knowledges, but also alternative, alternative knowledges, which are not knowledge, by the way, alternative knowledges and folk glaciologies that are generally marginalized through colonial, not through rigorous methodology, but through colonialism, imperialism, inequality, unequal power relations, patriarchy and the domination of Western science, back to citing the crackpot Sandra Harding on this point. An additional theoretical foundation for feminist glaciology is feminist political ecology, which has generally emphasized unequal vulnerability and disproportionate global change impacts. Take a second to throw up. Okay but which also contributes significant research on knowledge production, ontologies, and epistemologies. You see, the more of these like six, eight-syllable words you use, the smarter you are. The more true it must be, and the fewer people are going to be able to try to check you on it. You've now incorporated a ton of stuff, like knowledge production and epistemologies. Like does, you know, it, epistemology includes a study of knowledge production, but never mind, just list them together. Knowledge production, ontologies, what it means to be, and epistemologies. With hundreds of millions of people utilizing glaciers for everything from drinking water and hydroelectricity to recreation and spiritual sites, the disproportionate vulnerabilities and disparate adaptive, sorry, disparate adaptive capacities in these societies are critical to acknowledge. Lots of acknowledging, right? Which is what? What does it mean to, to acknowledge something? In a sense, in this case, it means to hand over authority to the, that thing, right? So there are people there, and we can't just go study glaciers. We have to hand over some authority to them because maybe they have recreation, maybe they have hydroelectricity, and maybe it's a spiritual site, and maybe it's a recreational site or whatever. So we have to hand them some authority. 
It's like stakeholder theory. There are stakeholders and what happens with the glaciers. So we have to listen to them about the glaciers. We can't just study them. Never mind the scientists in the past, say, 30 to 50 years have been extraordinarily cautious about not disrupting environments like they did in the past when they do their studies. Never mind that. Or that they're using, say, friggin' satellites to look down on the glaciers from 100 miles above the Earth's surface, and therefore they're not interrupting anybody's anything. But they will, in this paper, call that pornographic. And I kid you not. Feminist political ecology addresses how inequality and unequal power relations mediated and co-constituted through gender dynamics have silenced the knowledge of people, quote, most affected and marginalized by neoliberal, colonial, and patriarchal systems, end quote. So now you're starting to see why Peter and I saw this and we're like, they need a hoax. Six years ago, at the end of 2016, I said five earlier, I messed up. Six years ago, at the end of 2016, we were reading this and like, these people are ripe for hoax. Why? Because they just keep saying these freaking things. Neoliberal, colonial, imperial, patriarchal, unequal, inequitable, exclusive, blah, 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 cryoscape. And then, you know, you could write virtually anything you want in between as long as it sounds feministy. That's why we thought we could hoax them. It's really obvious. This thing is ridiculous. Remember, by the way, $500,000 or almost $500,000 of taxpayer money allocated for the sciences went to this shit. Crucially, for feminist glaciology, feminist political... We aren't even to the crazy stuff yet. Like I'm still like totally comfortable when I was reading this even the first time. Crucially, for feminist glaciology... Feminist political ecology argues for the integration of alternative ways of knowing, uh oh, beyond diverse women's knowledges to include more broadly the unsettling of Eurocentric knowledges. See, so we're not just looking for diverse women's knowledges, but we also want to unsettle the existing quote unquote Eurocentric knowledges, the questioning of dominant assumptions, and the diversification of modes and methods of knowledge production through the incorporation of everyday lived experiences, storytelling, narrative, and visual methods, just like critical race theory, but now feminist. This inclusion of alternative knowledges and narratives, remember those things are just narrative, alternative knowledges and narratives alongside analysis of colonialism and inequality, such as race relations, fits squarely into more recent feminist political ecologies that increasingly go, quote, beyond gender. Yeah, into what? Indigenous and race and sex and sexuality, because then they can usurp more human shields to hide behind. This means that the research builds on a, quote, history of boundary-breaking ideas, which sounds really great, but is actually the introduction of idiocy in politics, Boundary-breaking ideas that makes possible the present-day spaces where feminist geographers explore power, justice, and knowledge production, ideas that encompass but also surpass a focus on gender, end quote. So feminist geographers do what? They explore power, justice, and knowledge production. Do they do geography? Nope. They don't. They go after the sociological and anthropological underpinnings of the disciplines of geography so they can take over departments, take over conferences, take over the political sphere in which the sciences are done, and then transform them from within. That's the Antonio Gramsci enter and create a counter-hegemonic force. Remember before when they said the part of the point of alternative knowledges was to create counter-narratives? They're going to step in and use storytelling and so on in glaciological science to create counter-narratives, to create a counter-hegemony that then controls how the science is done, at which point it won't be a science anymore. It will be glaciological lysenkoism, which isn't nearly as scary as agricultural, biological, or medical lysenkoism, but it's still scary nonetheless because a science being perverted by ideology and politics is always a dangerous thing. Certainly, if you're a glaciologist, this should upset you. You are going to be displaced from your field if you don't bend the knee. Of course, this was six years ago. It's probably already too late for you. You didn't stand up. You thought, hmm, well, yes, this sounds very smart. And oh, yeah, women have been excluded. My goodness. How can I turn my spine to greater amounts of jelly and give over my career and my future and the science that I've devoted my life to so that these political activists can take it over and run it into the ground. Feminist glaciology raises critical, conceptual, analytical, and epistemological questions that are largely absent in the 21st century love affair with glaciers and ice. 
I don't know. Most of us don't seem to care much about glaciers or ice one way or the other. It's not that we don't care if they go away. We generally think that they're probably important and good, but we don't think about it very often because it's really actually not relevant. And they would say, well, that's see, that's unquestioned. That's assumptions. You're not questioning. You just, you're not paying attention. No, 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 no. That's not true. It's actually just not relevant to most people. There's no 20th first century love affair with glaciers and ice. This is not a thing. The framework offered here strives to open discussions, to introduce avenues of investigation. Doesn't all sound so like positive and aspirational when it's really like we're going to ruin your science? The framework offered here strives to open discussions. In other words, you're going to have to listen to their horseshit, and if you don't like it, you're not being inclusive. To introduce avenues of investigation. In other words, they're going to tell you different ways to study the stuff, and if which is going to be art, by the way. Glaciology, proceeding by art and feminist narratives and storytelling, and if you don't go along with it, then you are exclusive, not inclusive. And to suggest ways forward like under their control, probably, not only for scientific inquiry that includes the environmental humanities and social sciences, but also for public perceptions of glaciers. This is exactly like the UNESCO document about changing higher education institutions to achieve the sustainable development goals. The goals were to transform the natural science departments to include the humanities and social sciences, and also to weaponize them to transform public perceptions about the relevant subjects in line with the Sustainable Development Goals and their achievement. In other words, with a political agenda, literally called Agenda 2030 in that case. Examples within this review and synthesis article are primarily meant to expose the value and various dimensions of the feminist glaciological framework. They are not feminist glaciology framework, sorry. They are not meant to be comprehensive. See, there's going to be way more politics they can jam into this crap, but rather starting points to indicate lines of future investigation into this major gap in glacier studies, meaning all the non-scientific shit they're going to tell you and its related contribution to global environmental change research and both human and physical geography. Three, knowledge producers. Since the origins of the field of glaciology in the 19th century, the discipline has been dominated by men and masculinity. Well... Glaciology, polar exploration, and mountaineering, profoundly interconnected pursuits, have also been characterized by masculinist discourses that privileged manly exertion, heroism, and conquest. This is really, I think, one of the funniest parts of this paper. In polar sciences and Antarctica, in particular, women were marginalized and absent until at least the mid-20th century, while a white masculinist narrative emerged instead. Women, if mentioned at all, were often cast as men's curiosities or companions, as wives or helpers. Their appearance was almost always incidental to the aims of men and the male ship captains, expedition leaders, and government officials. As just one example, Louise Seguin sailed secretly on Captain Yves Joseph de Kerguelen's 1773 voyage to the Antarctic region. She made uh, scientific observations and discoveries, but at first hid from public visibility. Subsequent publicity about her presence tarnished Kerguelen's uh, reputation, I'm saying that wrong, and contributions thereby demonstrating not only how women's roles and activities have been eclipsed, but also how discovery and exploration were supposed to be men's terrain. Let me offer an alternative. This guy had a woman sneak onto his boat on a dangerous exposition. We're in 1773 on fucking wooden boats going to the Antarctic from France. A woman sneaks onto the boat. The guy's supposed to be making observations and be an astute observer and somehow didn't notice a woman made it onto his boat. Somehow failed to notice there was a woman there among the men on the boat. But that's not how they interpret it. Natural exploration, scientific practices, and patriarchy all resulted in the exclusion of women and the restriction of glaciological and other knowledge. Okay, so there's this weird thing in life that like women make babies. And there's been this huge amount of effort poured into, therefore, not putting women unduly into dangerous circumstances like, I don't know, being on a fucking wooden boat in the Antarctic sailing from France when most of the people on most of those boats died. That's patriarchy, y'all. It's crazy. 
Of course, women were not entirely absent from glaciology and related disciplines and activities. Fanny Bullock Workman, a famous mountaineer who also studied glaciers in the early 20th century, and Mary Morris Wal Walcott, who photographed and measured glaciers in the Canadian Rockies in the late 19th and early 20th century, represent exceptions to the male-dominated discipline of glaciology. Let's pause again and see if we can think of reasons why men might have dominated. Women make babies. Men don't make babies. Sperm is cheap. So we protect women from unnecessary and undue harm for kind of a good reason. Men are cheap and women are not. And so, and also men are more physically suited to go get their ass kicked in super cold environments. You ever been around a woman? They get cold all the time. Nevertheless, some women made it and did these things. So it's possible. But the fact of the matter is, we're talking about the 19th century, the 18th century, the early 20th century. Technology wasn't great. It wasn't exactly from, you know, your 2016 position, super cushy. It's not like you got to ride up there in like a nice cozy van on a nice, mostly paved road, right? Like, anyway, it's a male dominated discipline of glaciology. That's the problem. See, cause that put masculinist assumptions like being tough and not dying in the Arctic means that you probably were able to get more data. Hmm. In fact, Workman was part of a larger group of early 20th century women, such as Annie Smith Peck, who logged many first ascents and set ele elevation records in South America, who climbed mountains to make a case for women's suffrage and gender equality in the United States. Well, good for her. I really, you know, I applaud that. Good for her. There are, but, but it's rare. It's hard. There are also significant examples in Europe, such as Fanny Copeland. That's two Fannies. Wow. In mountaineering, however, men continued to be more numerous than women worldwide, even though an increasing number of women have been climbing peaks and doing glaciological research, especially since the 1970s. I wonder if anything changed by the time we're getting to the 1970s. You know, like having stuff that protects you better? Maybe? It's better safety equipment? I don't know. I, I couldn't possibly fathom what it would be. Nevertheless, it should be noted that neither masculinity nor the social construction of mountaineering have remained static over time. No, really, as it became open to more people because of safety technology and paved roads and things like that, more people could participate in it who have kind of different constitutional abilities and the interest and willingness to do it. Hmm, weird how that works, isn't it? Like, do you know how many more people would be studying, like, I don't know, volcanoes if we had, like, completely flame-retardant suits? They'd be walking around the volcanoes all over the place. Turns out lava's dangerous. Not that many people do it. It's risky. So the people who want to do it are high-risk takers. Turns out that that correlates strongly with testosterone levels, which correlates almost perfectly. There's almost no overlap between testosterone levels between men and women. Extremely low T men and extremely high T women are still separated. The man still usually has much more, as in a few times more. Weird. It's weird, but it's socially constructed, they said. The social construction of mountaineering hasn't remained static over time. It's important to probe the nuances of gender within each place and period under consideration to avoid simplistic male-female binaries or fixed views of gender, glaciers, and mountaineering. Maybe you should look at the not-fixed views of how technology progresses and makes the project more accessible to more people. And something people would be interested in doing because the access increased. Like, if you come back, like James Lindsay right now, do you want to go to the top of a 14,000-foot mountain? Yeah, sure, let's see what's up there. James Lindsay and say, 1830. Do you want to go up to the top of a 14,000 foot mountain? Why the fuck do I want to do that? I might fucking die. I got shit to do. It's really like, do the calculation, guys. Wonder why it got, is, is the social constructions changed though? Is the social constructions changing that enabled more people to do it? It's really weird. Both male dom the, I hate these people and their stupid way that they misanalyze everything through their weird power grabbing lens. Both male-dominated glaciology and masculinist... So at this point, when I'm reading this back in 2016, like my eye, eyelid was probably starting to twitch. I'm like, what? wait, what? What are they talking about? Like, who cares if that's what was going on in, the, say, 1773 or the early 20th century? Like, this shit's dangerous. Like, this doesn't make any sense. What does that have to do with how glaciology is done with satellites and ice cores? Who cares who's doing it? Somebody can go and they can safely gather the data and they can do something rigorous with the data. Who cares? 
And of course, at the beginning, it was a bunch of crackpot nonsense because nobody knew what they were doing. I, of course, know the history also of where geology came from, where they were fighting over what kind of rocks were on the bottom of the ocean. Turns out they were arguing over the origins of, of, of sea bottom basalt, B-A-S-A-L-T, if you're trying to figure out what I just said. I might have said it wrong. Maybe it's basalt. I don't know. They're trying to figure it out. And did it come from the, U- U- the Uranian explanation, which is that it was somehow precipitated out of the ocean, or from the Nep- uh, the, the Vulcani, uh, the, what is it, the, Vul- the Vulcanian or Vulcan, the Vulcan explanation, which is that volcanoes made it, which turned out to be right. And they were literally like just fighting with each other and yelling and calling each other names and canceling each other and like showing up to people's wives like plays and like throwing things and booing them off the stage instead of, you know, finally we have the father of, uh, modern geology comes in and I'm trying to think of this guy's name. It'll come to me later. Um, and it was like, I have a weird idea. Let's look at the rocks. Let's just study the rocks and find out. And then they were able to determine that, that the Vulcans were right. And the Neptunians were wrong. Maybe I said Uranians earlier. I don't know who cares. It does not come from precipitated ocean water. It comes from the volcanoes under the ocean. Mm, okay. Maybe, maybe sciences, when they first start out, are a bunch of crackpots going into some new environment knowing friggin' nothing and doing the best that they can until some actual methodology develops. Anyway, both male-dominated glaciology and masculinist narratives about glacier knowledge production have persisted, despite the slowly increasing participation of women in glaciology since the 1970s. When women did begin working in Antarctica, media commentary and reporting often portray them as, quote, girls, who were, quote, invading male terrains. And they have a citation to 1986. Um, okay. A leading science journalist of his time, Walter Sullivan, 1969, of the New York Times, described the first all-women scientific expedition to Antarctica in 1969 as, quote, an incursion of females into, quote, the largest male sanctuary remaining on the planet. Okay, so some dude writing for the New York Times, which is always on the wrong side of everything, um, explained in 1969 some sexist view about Antarctica. Okay, so what? Who cares? Who cares what some journalist said? Like, why do you care? A leading science journalist. You're sci- if you, you guys are researchers. You know that science journalism is horseshit. Except they don't because they don't know any science, actually. Another, But they would love to control science journalism because apparently they think it's influential. Another article on this exposition, expedition speculated about the women's about women the women's potential, quote, loneliness or, quote, the possibility of running into a mad seal. Whereas a contemporary, also cited 1969, whereas a contemporaneous report of men's work was headlined, Antarctica, men risk death to unlock its awesome secrets, 1970. While men had agency and control over their fate, women were at the mercy of their emotions and treacherous nature. I wonder if there are any differences between men and women that might have led people to think that. The British were especially slow to support female scientists in Antarctica, not allowing women to join summer research expeditions until the early 1980s and finally to overwinter until the early 1990s. Hmm. So let's put coeds in a locked environment for months at a time. Hmm. Wonder what's going to happen. Hmm. The British experience is especially noteworthy because the glaciologist Elizabeth Morris was appointed head of the Earth Sciences Division of the British Antarctic Survey, BAS, before she became the first woman to join a BAS field team in Antarctica in 1987. Norwegian Polar Institute glaciologist Elizabeth Isaacson expresses her dismay about that 1987 expedition, recalling that Morris had, quote, had to talk to all of the researchers' wives and ensure them that she would not hit on their husbands. I wonder what might happen when you lock people in a research facility away from everybody else for like six months. Isaacson explains that, quote, it's like you think you're hearing it wrong, that we're talking about 1887 and not 1987. Mm Mm-hmm, sure. Because, you know, a hundred years later, men and women stopped fucking each other. Marked shifts in women's roles in glaciology and polar research occurred during the 1980s. By the way, there's a contradiction though, right? They're already admitting that in 1887, those kinds of attitudes were to be expected. They've just admitted that 
1887, much less 1773, those attitudes were to be expected. But that was crucial evidence a couple of paragraphs back, right? So just to point out a little contradiction, marked shift, marked, 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 marked shifts in women's roles in glaciology and polar research occurred during the 1980s. Wonder why? Technology, maybe? Feminism, somewhat. Reversing longstanding trends. Though women began publishing in the Journal of Glaciology and the Annals of Glaciology soon after the journals emerged in the late 1940s, weird. Women were already publishing in the journal, almost the journals, the primary journals almost immediately, but somehow there was sexism. They only accounted for one or two articles a year, and many years had no female authors in either journal. Those numbers rose from 10 women in, the, in total publishing in the two journals in 1979 to 55 women in 1990. Though there was another dip in the numbers in the early 1990s a, until a steady increase to the present. Uh, to the present. So, sorry, there's a citation there, so I didn't know if the sentence continued. So my intonation was off. Um, Yes. Okay. So, despite significant, their strong their their strong objectivity wasn't present because there were fewer women. Despite significant progress for women in glaciology since 1979, women in 2009 still represented less than 20 percent of authors in these two flagship glaciological journals. Who cares? In terms of grant recipients and principal investigators, that's things they really love to focus on to prove that there's sexism in science. Did you see what they're doing, though? They're looking at the anthropology of the field and saying, look how exclusive to women it's been. We have to in- make deliberate attempts to include women because women's perspectives, scientific perspectives, are somehow different. No, they're not when you have rigorous science, as a matter of fact. But they think it is. It's more strongly objective. In terms of grant recipients and principal investigators, 24% of principal investigators or co-principal investigators on U.S. National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs in the period of the fourth international polar year, 2007 through 2009, were women, up only from 18% in 1997 through 1999. Again, so... The male-dominated landscape is not confined to science and exploration. Men dominate in Arctic literature as well. Okay. So, of the 1945 works of literature on the Arctic and northern regions that are part of the International Library of of the Comparative Multidisciplinary Study of Representation of the North at the University du Québec in Montreal, only 401 were authored by women, which represents about 20%, the same percentage of female characters in these books, which is the same percentage of female characters in a lot of the hard sciences and in the mathematics, and no matter how hard they bend over backwards in tech, huh, wonder if there's something magic about that number, like that's roughly the proportion of talented individuals at that level of uh, competence who are interested in doing that. And but that was James Damore's memo to Google that got him wrecked and then fired. Measuring women's involvement by tracking their published literature or other similar metrics risks recognizing women in glaciology only if they behave like men, well, that's actually what feminists say and think, or do the things that men do, such as earning a PhD in a university where men hold a majority of leadership and faculty positions. Wait, what? Earning a PhD, like earning a PhD, no, not just any PhD, a PhD from a university where men are in charge, okay? Or publishing in peer reviewed journals often managed by men. So I was really six years ago reading this, like, what the hell is this? It, this whoever wrote this knows very little or no science, is what it boils down to. Or they're a total crackpot who's forgotten what science is about because they've sucked up to the ideology. It also ignores the preponderance of sexual harassment and sexual assault by field scientists and other disciplines, especially at early career stages. And other disciplines? What? And sexual harassment and sexual assault, but let's lock you guys up together in Antarctic facilities for six months? Like, are you guys paying attention? Like, do these people have brains? Like, what the hell are they talking about? And yeah, here we are again. We're studying the sociology of the field. So far, not a single damn thing about glaciology has been talked about in the paper about feminist glaciology. Literally none. It's all about sociology and anthropology. Clancy et al., 2014, sampled 666... Ah, no kidding. 
666 researchers in other science fields to find out that 64% of the women reported they had experienced sexual harassment, while more than 20% revealed that they had experienced sexual assault. Well, if this had happened after 2014, after the Me Too phenomenon, I guess it would have been 99% and 80% because all of a sudden the definition expanded tremendously to make sure that those things were really prevalent, prevalent in everything and they could use that to leverage to get women in charge of things because it's all about fake narratives to gain power. Women were 3.5 times more likely to experience harassment than men, indicating its gendered nature. Mm-hmm. I mean... Okay, men are pigs. More at 11. What do you want to hear? Let's lock them up together for six months in an Antarctic research facility where they literally can't leave. Huh. Wild. While the Clancy et al. 2014 study is not about glaciological field work or glaciology field work or the experiences of female glaciologists per se, and so it's not even really germane. It illuminates trends in these other fieldwork-focused disciplines to suggest that analyzing only the numbers of participating women in glaciology may obscure many other aspects of gender discrimination in glaciology. So they have no evidence about what's going on in glaciology, so they use another science. But they're saying that the specifics of glaciological, anthropological, and sociological history are what make the problem. Again, the contradictions are flourishing. I'm not saying they're wrong about the sexual harassment. I think it's very likely. I'm saying that they can't make a cogent argument, which seems to matter when you're publishing in a leading geography journal, or should, which is why I started to get massive cognitive dissonance reading this paper in 2016 to the point where I basically shut down for three days. We haven't even got to that part, though. To balance out the... I was still just like, what in the world am I reading when I was reading this before? I mean, this is one of the first of their papers I really read all the way through. To balance out the male-dominated world of glaciology, unique pro programs such as, quote, Girls on Ice seek to provide glaciology and life training for high school-aged young women in, the field, in field schools in Alaska and Washington State. This program offers an alternative to the more traditional path to a career in glaciology or any field, as it specifically focuses on empowering women through their experiences and with research about glaciers. While the program may perpetuate a male-female binary, so it's not even good enough because it's specifically to give women a leg up, it may perpetuate a male-female binary that feminist studies and queer theory have long sought to dismantle. Girls on Ice plays a key role in glaciology to provide female role models, to understand glaciers in unique experiential ways, to imbue teenage women, teenage women with the confidence to become scientists and community leaders, and to inspire them about learning science. So what they're saying is that girls don't need to see the science. They need role models. They need a social phenomenon, Ex unique experiential ways. So they need to go on little adventures to experience glaciers and kind of a community. To have confidence that they might be missing to become scientists or community leaders and to inspire them about learning science because their poor pretty heads can't get it over. They can't get their poor pretty heads around the idea that girls can be scientists. This so They're so patronizing. The program's founder, Aaron Pettit, maintains that it is essential to restrict girls on ice solely to young women. Uh-oh, transphobia. Yeah, uh-oh. I hope this still exists and they get blasted. That'd be so funny. Girls on Ice needs to include trans women, needs to include young trans women. And then they can get raped on ice. This is a course to get dirty. Wear clothing or harnesses and helmets that are not necessarily the most beautiful or flattering. Holy shit, this is why it has to be solely to young women. This is a course to get dirty. Wear clothing or harnesses and helmets that are not necessarily the most beautiful or flattering. Because those are the things girls are going to care about if boys are around, right? Our society has taught girls not to like any of those things. And not to show their interest or intelligence in science. Bullshit. But I want to provide a space without that pressure where the girls can show their interest, their intelligence, their strength. Then, when they get back home, hopefully they will feel a bit less constrained. What a strange motivation. They'll feel a bit less constrained because they're going to be motivated to be beautiful and flattering in front of boys. Participants confirm the importance of an all-women team, noting in particular the benefits of female scientists' role models because maybe they struggle to compete against boys. Is that what you're suggesting? These experiences and insights are critical for women in a field 
in which men typically run the graduate programs, edit the journals, and peer review the majority of papers. You see, because men hate women, which the research doesn't bear out, but that's their assumption, and therefore men won't let women in. They'll put up fake barriers to entry unless women have a kind of like special program to get them off the ground. These people trip all over themselves trying to like say that women are not less than anybody else by saying in like 85,000 ways that they believe that women are less than everybody else. I guess everybody else is men. Local, non-Western, and indigenous societies are often no more egalitarian than scientific disciplines such as glaciology. Huh, how about that? Really? And thus they too experience differential representation in the productions of environmental knowledges. Huh, why don't you just read that part again? Because it's a big Western imperial colonialist patriarchy problem, right? Local, non-Western, and indigenous societies are often no more egalitarian than scientific disciplines such as glaciology. How about that? How about that? Hmm, I wonder if there's any possible commonality. Oh, of course, it's patriarchy. And thus, they too experience differential representation in the production of environmental knowledges. Klein et al. 2014 report in their study of Tibetan herders' understandings and observations of climate change, for example, that bias and inequality exist in those communities in Nangchu Prefecture. This is like when uh, Matt Walsh went to um, Africa to ask them about if they knew what a woman was, and they laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. It was not possible to achieve gender balance in their interviews, for instance, because women repeatedly refused to be interviewed, citing their own lack of knowledge and illustrating how dominant perceptions of, quote, glaciology can emerge, which may in some cases suppress alternative knowledges. They just trip all over themselves. Women often do possess different knowledge about glaciers due to many issues, such as spending more time than men attending to livestock near Andean glaciers. Managing agriculture, terracing, and irrigation that includes the distribution of glacier runoff in highland Peruvian communities. Being responsible for mobility, storage, and shelter amidst changes to snowfall and other cryospheric uh, changes on the Tibetan Plateau. Expressing water supplies in the Ganges River through spiritual frameworks that contradict hydrological models. Hold up. We'll come back to that one. And responding to diminishing water supplies and Tajikistan mountains with, a more, with more efficient water use practices as opposed to men's reactions to immigrate from their communities. Okay, so they're saying in a lot of these different situations in Peru, in the Andes, um, on the Tibetan Plateau, in Tajikistan, you have this situation where women, for whatever set of reasons and their social roles that they have in their indigenous herder communities or whatever they are, sometimes know things about the glaciers. They have practical knowledge because they spend more time near them. But then you throw this one in. Expressing water supplies in the Ganges River through spiritual frameworks that contradict hydrologic models. So the women are wizards or witches or something. They know spiritual frameworks to understand the river that the hydrologic models, that's a science. So it's masculinist and excludes their stupid superstitions. Ah, God. Nevertheless, it is critical to avoid objectifying women's vulnerability, clinging to a sharp male-female binary, or portraying women as passive victims. After all, climate change can lead to the breakdown of stereotypical gender roles and even, quote, gender renegotiation. Hmm. Moreover, the romanticization of women's environmental sensibilities or the overclassification of women as poverty-stricken and marginalized in local communities can render them passive. Such representations often privilege environmental forces such as climate, glaciers, drought, or hydrology instead of spiritual forces acting on women without sufficient analysis of power relations and inequalities that more profoundly affect vulnerability and knowledge disparities. Oh, one way to diversify knowledge production and collect environmental knowledge from local women is through emerging methodologies such as, we're going to hear glaciology techniques, such as locally-led indigenous ethnographic video, including audiovisual storytelling among women in the Pamir Mountains of Tajikistan. This project's goal was to examine how local indigenous assignments of climate change and glacier shrinkage corresponded with scientific, governmental, and NGO conclusions. 
Team leaders specifically sought women's voices and contributions after recognizing that women generally did not hold public positions of authority. Ultimately, the video production process not only involved local women in three communities, but also went beyond participation to achieve active collaboration in both the video creation and the collection of climate and glacier-related knowledge. Knowledge about cl changing climactic conditions in glaciers varied among the women involved, with one participant appreciating the warmer weather at high, ele high elevation, another lamenting the loss of a glacial lake for its hydrologic impacts, and another who inhabited an urban area being largely unfamiliar with nearby environmental changes. <laughs> so stupid. Including these divergent local voices and perspectives diversifies and localizes the information produced in a national. Whoops, I scrolled. Sorry, in national climate assessments. Maybe these are done by the NGOs, and underscores the disconnect between local women's knowledge and Western scientific conclusions expressed in the IPCC and elsewhere. Why well, I wonder why there's a disconnect. Williams and uh, Golovnev believe this is vital to in illustrate, given the ways in which policy is too often based solely on Western science. Quote, the Western climate science to policy paradigm, they conclude, quote, paralyzes public agency through elitist mechanistic science, market-driven governance decisions, and globally dominant consumer-skewed media network products, like sustainable development goals promoted on CNN, I suppose. Wait, no. This approach to environmental governance is oppressive for people, peoples with different cultural configurations. Involving local indigenous women or any marginalized groups facilitates equality and self-determination while simultaneously producing more equitable discussions about the cryoscape, climate, and global environmental change, including, of course, <laughs> interviewing the woman from the city who doesn't know what the hell's going on or what they're even talking about. So you're going to go get the opinions of local women, and that's going to have to count as informative to science change, scientific analysis on climate change, because exclusion has to be moved to the center or something. Four, gendered science and knowledge. It's getting thicker. The history of glaciology is not simply about the ubiquity of men and the absence and or erasure of women. It is, it's not just about that. It is also about how scientific practices and results are gendered. See, this is what I'm saying. They're going to go after the, science, the, the, the sociology around the science and its anthropology. Then they're going to say that the scientific practices and the results themselves have a problem, in this case, are gendered, and therefore need to be transformed by the feminist lens ideology. Many natural science fields have historically been defined by and their credibility built upon manly attributes such as heroic, often nationalistic exploration and triumphs over hostile, wild, and remote landscapes. Well, yeah, it turns out that doing that shit is cool and it's dangerous, so men very prominently are the ones that do it and that we encourage to do it. Like, this isn't rocket science, guys. Feminist science studies began critiquing the gendered dimensions of environmental knowledge several decades ago. These scholars and others since have argued that the Bacon this is Francis Bacon, the Baconian view of knowledge in engendered a strong tendency in the environmental sciences to classify, measure, map, and ideally dominate and control non-human nature as if it were a knowable and predictable machine rather than a dynamic, chaotic, unpredictable, and coupled natural human, uh, sorry, natural hyphen human systems. Okay, so listen, here's some backstory you need to know. In the 90s, these feminist science studies researchers, 80s and 90s, went ape shit on Newton and especially Francis Bacon. So remember Newton wrote a rape manual in Principia Mathematica? Well, Bacon had like all these sexist views allegedly baked into his, his philosophy of science, which is really the starting place of modern science, philosophically speaking. And so they go after Francis Bacon because he's kind of the point where the whole thing started. So they say he put this sexist stuff in. And so science has always been sexist. Therefore, feminism is needed to transform it. Even though, even if Bacon was writing sexist stuff in, which there are some sentences that they harp on, like a handful of them where he uses analogies to, you know, like, you know, things being like the, the something is like the wife of the something else, and it says whatever that means in gender roles of the 1500s. 
Because he wrote that all of science has to be subjected to feminist revision is basically their argument. And it's really kind of like funny, but the, when they say these scholars and others since have argued that the Baconian view, so the Francis Bacon view of knowledge engendered a strong tendency in the environmental sciences to do masculine things like classify, measure, map, and ideally dominate and control non-human nature, instead of seeing it as dynamic, chaotic, unpredictable, and coupled with natural slash human systems. Such feminist critiques apply today to glaciology, climate sciences, and global environmental change research more broadly. Terry, 2009, for example, argues that climate discourse, quote, is still a stereotypically masculine one of new technologies, large-scale economic instruments, and complex computer modeling. See, because poor girls suck at computers which for glaciers can render them static, essentialized, and passive. Fleming, 2010, finds a similar story of domination in the climate sciences, in which 20th century scientists and engineers used cloud seeding and other geoengineering strategies to manipulate weather, steer storms, and make rain. Holy shit, is that chemtrails? Technoscientific control is a dominant trope in climate change discourse and knowledge, and it is by nature highly gendered. So I guess Bill Gates' plan to try to block out the sun is sexist. Is that like a th is that what we're saying here? Much geographical fieldwork involves this masculinist reflexivity, generating supposed objectivity through distance and from dis uh, sorry through distance from and disinterest in the subject. In other words, objectivity, right? But it's supposed objectivity. These conclusions transcend gendered gendered dimensions of knowledge by acknowledging broader trends in Western sciences that have sought to place science at a godlike vantage from nowhere, ignoring both situated knowledges and geography of science. In other words, ignoring these activists. Literally feminist activists trying to take over science for being ignored, and they don't like that. Gendered aspects of cryospheric knowledge, so the cryoscape is out, gendered aspects of cryospheric knowledge have existed for centuries. In the 1730s, for instance, the French crown sent, sent geodetic expeditions sorry, to Peru and the Arctic, specifically Lapland. The naturalist adventurers chronicled in their reports how they overcame savage environments and bitter cold conditions, frequently celebrating their selfless, heroic risk-taking. As the Arctic explorer uh, Pierre-Louis Moreau de uh, Maurepetui um, explained characteristically for his for this genre of scientific writing, quote, you may imagine what it is to walk two feet in two feet of snow carrying heavy measuring sticks, which must be continually set down in the snow and retrieved. All this in a cold so great that when we tried to drink uh, eau de vie, uh, which is liquor, the only drink that could be kept liquid, the tongue and lips froze instantly against the cup and could only be torn away bleeding. Terrell, 1998, concludes that, quote, the physical strength and perseverance necessary to conquer such obstacles made the returning men of science not just selfless seekers of truth, but tough adventurers. That sounds legit. <laughs> like, okay, so you have these French guys in the 1730s that go to super cold environments in Lapland and to mountaintops in Peru and they almost freeze to death, and they explain how cold it is, and that's the problem. And they come back, and they're regarded as having made a sacrifice so that they could learn more about these environments, whether they did a good job of it or not, and that they risked themselves to do so, and that they were tough by going to do it, because it was actually brutally cold and dangerous. It's not like going and getting some, like, top Arctic gear at the fucking store and going, uh, and, you know, this high-tech shit we have now. This was 1730. These were French, it's, the, t the I mean, it snows in France, but it's freaking mild. So, ugh. But the Lapland and Peru expeditions were also about promoting France's prestige in the wake of new scientific discoveries. Yeah, no shit. Look, we did, we could fund this crazy dangerous thing and we got knowledge nobody else has. Yeah, that's prestigious. Male triumph over hostile nature in isolated spaces in the name of science fed nationalism and colonialism, and these forces co-constituted a masculinist glaciology. It makes me just want to fucking climb on my own rocket, fly to the moon, and stick an American flag right next to a big flag that the new discourses with James Lindsay on it. 
Like, take a picture of me manspreading on the moon. I mean, good lord. When debates about glacier motion emerged in the second half of the 19th century, two central protagonists, the early leading glaciologists James Forbes and John Tyndall, competed for credibility by pinning their scientific contributions to their abilities as, quote, manly mountaineers and heroic conquerors of the European Alps. Forbes theorized that glaciers behaved more like a semi-fluid body flowing downhill as a viscous fluid rather than as a solid object. He highlighted his fieldwork in the mountains and among, among the glaciers to legitimate his theory. Tyndall, on the other hand, argued that glaciers moved more like a solid substance flowing over bedrock. He eventually triumphed in this debate, contends heavily 1996, because Tyndall mobilized his greater fame as a mountaineer, having achieved many pioneering first ascents, and deployed a rhetoric of manly risk and exertion. There was what Heavily calls a, quote, culture of field science in the 19th century that favored, quote, authentic, rigorous, manly experience. In scientists, let alone women, who did not explicitly demonstrate that their glaciological conclusions stemmed from heroic, manly adventures, struggled to make their scientific claims credible. Record scratch. We're talking about the fucking 19th century, guys. We're not talking about glaciology in 2016 when you wrote this paper. We're talking about the 19th century. But again, if you believe that things work in systems that perpetuate themselves and only change meaningfully through absolute revolution in which a new form of ideologues takes control, then of course this matters. If you believe that people hearing these things, when heavily wrote them in 1996, laugh a little bit and think, well, that's quaint, or yeah, well, times were like that. That's very 19th century or whatever. If you realize that that's actually how people, what it means is that people in 1996, when he's writing that, have already not, they already stopped thinking that way. They already don't. They trip over themselves every time they try to make a case. Their anthropology actually that they use very effectively to leverage power for themselves undermines them at every turn. But anyway, they tell us glaciology was, remember, in the 19th century, so in the 1800s, glaciology was for muscular gentlemen scientists. Women could read about glaciers in the Alps, but they were not fit for glaciological research, field science, or even alpine tourism. Yeah, because you might fucking die. It's not like it's safe. And men like Forbes, who lacked the manly heroism of risk-taking mountaineers, lost scientific credibility that hinged on masculinism. Heroic conquests were also central to Arctic and Antarctic explorations from the 19th century. Notice where we still are, the 19th century. The Arctic was an important site of American exploration in the 19th century because it was a, a space where the nation's anxieties about the perils of over-civilization, quote, manly character and racial purity, could be tested, according to Robinson in 2006. Ice had a great hold on the British imagination at the same time, as the Arctic was a space in which British explorers could manifest their evangelical Christianity while sim simultaneously affirming the place of women in the domestic sphere through passive consumption of heroic and manly stories. So preposterous. Have you heard anything about how to do glacier stuff yet, except to interview women who don't know what's going on that live near glaciers? Antarctic exploration in the first half of the 20th century continued this emphasis on manly, uh, on manly endeavor, especially through military structures, such as through the centrality of the Royal Navy to British expositions at both pole, expeditions at both poles, or the mid-20th century American projections into Antarctica and the Arctic. These same masculinist tendency, tendencies were also reinforced through the scientific and geographical institutions that sponsored research and exploration, such as the Royal Geographical Society in London, which did not admit, admit women fellows until 1913, or the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge, where work despite discourses of masculine adventure and field research relied on the barely recognized library and administrative labor of women. So wait, women were the librarians and therefore... Never mind, it's... Never mind. Are you catching the theme here? The only way... You read all this stuff and you think, you're a normal person, right? You're a normal person. You Maybe you're like me. I was a fairly normal person. I was steeped in the sciences. I was a big fan of the sciences. I had majored in physics. I have a degree in math. 
I believe in academic research. I didn't know yet that the thing had been corrupted. And you're reading this and you're thinking, who the hell cares? This was like over a hundred years ago. Like, yeah, no shit. Shit was backwards then. Everyone knows that. Who cares? The only, you're a normal person. You cannot comprehend why this is here. The only reason that anybody could give a possible, and a lot of people now would take, take for granted that this makes sense for their argument, because in just five or six years, we've warped our minds so far into the identity political that we've actually imbibed a bunch of their garbage and we're drunk on it. The only way that this makes any sense is if you believe that systems are set up with ideological power embedded within them in hidden structural ways that perpetuate until you have a political revolution within them or a cultural revolution within them. Fake. Masculine and heroic rhetoric was so dominant. This is like the, I was reading this back in the day thinking this is so pointless. Why the hell is this here? Who cares? What does it have to do with glaciology today? Nothing. Why does it? Well, who cares? But that's why they care. And I, in 2016, didn't know enough to know why they cared. Masculine and heroic rhetoric was so dominant that attempts to reframe discourses of Arctic work in the 1950s and 1960s as part of broader attempts by environmental scientists to make their science more, quote, scientific through experimentation rather than observation had limited success. The scientific leaders of the Canadian Polar Continental Shelf Project 1958 through 1970, for example, attempted to frame the Arctic as an, quote, experimental space rather than an, quote, expeditionary space as the basis of the credibility of both their scientific work and Canada's territorial aspirations. Yet their deployment of, quote, a precarious authority of experiment fared poorly in the course of difficult Arctic fieldwork. They could not escape the, quote, Boy Scout attitude to Arctic fieldwork and the, quote, epistemic baggage of the exploratory tradition in the adventurous observation. Though these attempted reframings of Arctic work did not preclude latent masculinities, they did suggest tensions with more explicit masculinities. So now, okay, 1958 through 1970, stuff's starting to change, but people are like, eh, I don't know. Okay, so what? Who cares? These masculinist and heroic narratives persist today. This should be exciting. The Ohio State University glaciologist Lonnie Thompson, who extracts and studies high mountain ice cores, for example, has been described as today's Indiana Jones and, quote, one of the true scientific heroes of our age. While Thompson conscientiously studies ice and works with local communities, media and popular accounts cast him, regardless of his actual intentions, as a pioneer explorer, overcoming hardships and conquering supposedly unknown mountains in distant places. I bet you he actually does that. Don't call him Indiana Jones. That would be, you know, in popular press because that would be fun and relatable, but it would make him look cool and he's a man. Most popular accounts of Thompson, which often overlook the presence of his wife, Ellen Mosley Thompson, a world-renowned ice researcher, focus explicitly on his overcoming asthma and a host of other obstacles while conducting field work. Overcoming personal hardship is also at the center of the documentary film Chasing Ice, 2012, and its protagonist, the filmmaker-photographer James Balog. Instead of focusing on the glaciers that Balog photographs, the film follows him as an extreme ice survey into, quote, treacherous terrain, where Balog struggles with failing knees, strenuous conditions, falling rocks and ice, and existential risk to tell the tale of vanishing glaciers. Balog's assistants even wonder in one scene if they should have stuck to their office jobs given the risks they face in the field. Anybody who's ever worked with media knows that they try to make stuff sexy, and so if they just went and it was really boring, like a freaking you know, Discovery Channel thing used to be, no one's going to watch it, which is why everything's so over the top now, because they have to make it sexy. Balog may not have chosen this approach, he probably did, but the filmmakers and media adhere to tropes of masculine vigor, risk, and adventurous exploration and heroic science to attract audiences and validate research, thereby sustaining these masculinist glacier narratives into the 21st century. You see, up until these political idiots decided they're going to try to like take everything over, it was kind of a general attitude that if you did a lot of public consumption stuff as an academic, you were doing something not that good because of these exact forces. Um, I mean... 
people are going to be interested in what they're interested in. The, what's the mass market? They're confusing like scientific research and mass market interest. And so this guy who is a filmmaker gets treated by the public like he's a glaciologist, whereas glaciologists literally don't give a shit about that stuff or they're annoyed by it. And so glaciology is a problem. We need feminism because media images. So then I brought media studies in, which again, have you heard a single damn thing about glacier research yet? Except that we should interview women who live near glaciers that don't know what's going on? No, of course you haven't because they don't have any glacier research stuff. They, li li they literally don't have any. Maybe they should have highlighted Thompson's wife or something and they would be happier. Thompson and Balog's work is impressive to be sure. Oh, okay, good. Because collecting the data they gathered was no easy feat. Wait a minute, that's the thing you were just saying is you're not supposed to highlight. And they are yielding insights for science and climate change impacts. Wait a minute. That's literally the shit that you're not supposed to celebrate. But read alongside other heroic scientific narratives, the masculinist attributions ascribed to this type of field science remain prevalent over three centuries. Oh, but because there's other literature that's similar to it, including 300 years ago or 200 years ago, it's a problem. But it's okay this time, but it's a problem. But it's okay this time. To be credible, glaciologists, according to most commentators, still need to be experienced mountain climbers to overcome high altitude, limited oxygen, cold temperatures, circumscribed logistical support, and overall rugged working conditions. Uh, they study glaciers? So, uh, if they're field scientists? Kinda? As Savage, 2015, reports in the journal Nature, young scientists, this is a quote, Young scientists who are considering a career in ice core, ice core paleoclimatology ought to have some experience with climbing, says Doug Hardy of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, if only to know whether or not they can handle it, end quote. While Savage recognizes that those without, quote, the inclination or the ability to climb glaciers, end quote, can find other positions in glaciology, such as computer modeling, the article's subheadline, quote, climb any mountain, Glaciology is an outdoors game, end quote. Certainly does not, uh, sorry, certainly does not celebrate these indoor desk jobs. No shit. Nor what would they do if somebody wasn't going and looking at the actual ice? Nor does a depict, create theory, play games with the social environment? Oh yes, that. Nor does a dis such a depiction consider class barriers for entry into the field, such as the high cost of acquiring and maintaining necessary alpine skills. Oh, it's bourgeois because it's expensive to be able to be safe in extreme environments. Alternative knowledges and practices are marginalized in the sustained masculinist atmosphere, restricting scientific questions asked, practic uh, practitioners involved, methods employed, and sites studied, and uh, sorry, site studies and results achieved. So in other words, it's not perfectly accessible to all, so it's sexist. Got you. It is, you know, it's not the fact that the environments are super dangerous. It's that everything isn't perfect that makes it so that it's not perfect. It's not perfectly inclusive, therefore it's problematic. It has nothing to do with the actual reality, because reality is pretend. Reality is what you make of it. It's phenomenological. Manliness in the field thus makes the science and scientist more credible. A recent, no, you only, your only example of that was a documentary guy and one famous guy that was held up in a mass media appeal. You haven't talked about the impact factor, the research impact of any researcher whatsoever. You've talked about two cases in the media. So bad. You did a media analysis and mistook it for an actual analysis of impact. But, of course, because you're frauds. The researchers that did this paper are frauds. They defrauded the American public of $500,000 to do this horseshit. A recent feature in the New York Times, oh shit, another media analysis, follows researchers onto the Greenland ice sheet, for example, where they race against time in a precarious helicopter, survive the, quote, frozen landscape of this uh, hostile environment, and altruistically overcome death to get, a glacier, to get glacier runoff data. So it's bad again. It was good, when, but it was bad. But it's good, but it's bad. As Lincoln Pitcher was quoted saying, if his fellow researcher fell into the river atop the ice sheet, quote, the death rate is 100%, end quote. The article focuses on very little of the scientific questions asked 
Really? That's a problem for you guys? The article focuses very little on the scientific questions asked. The article in the New York Times doesn't really talk about this. These people can't tell the difference between reality and media. They just cannot tell the difference between reality and media. The article focuses very little on the scientific questions asked or even the scientific implications of the study beyond broad claims about glacier shrinkage and sea level rise. It focuses instead on the processes of doing the glaciological science, not the science itself. Really, a media portrayal cares more about telling stories than it does about dry-ass science. And that's the thing you're confusing for how much impact actually occurs in the science. So frustrating these people have any audience whatsoever. Yet, New York Times coverage for these researchers has nothing to do with their scientific chops. Let me make that clear. Carry at all who wrote this paper, it has fucking nothing to do with their scientific credibility. Yet New York Times coverage for these researchers, especially the gradu graduate student at the center of it, can significantly enhance a career. Maybe. In this way, the portrayal of masculinist researchers in the media, because that's what sells, presumably, can shape scientific credibility in the academy such as with hiring and possibly even with peer reviewing. Okay, so first of all, peer reviewing is blind, so probably not when it's done right. But second of all, that's literally what you guys, the feminists, want. You want to be able to shape, you already said that, that you wanted to shape credibility and authority within the academy, such as with hiring and possibly even with peer reviewing. Being a pioneer, as instead of being a feminist, being first instead of being a loser, enduring physical hardship instead of sitting at a desk and writing feminist theory, risking death instead of being a putz, overcoming wild nature instead of pretending you are, overcoming masculinist challenges and rape culture. In short, being as manly as a Victorian mountaineer glaciologist were more than a century ago continues to influence scientists' credibility. I added some things there, by the way. Or on the other side, their lack of credibility for those who cannot pitch their research through such masculinist frameworks. Again, that entire section, which is about knowledge production. Let me find out what this section was called. I'm so pissed off. I'm like legit pissed off. We're several pages of bullshit here. Wow, it's so many pages of bullshit. Holy shit. It really was a lot of pages of bullshit. Gendered science and knowledge. So we're going to make the conclusion that science is gendered and knowledge is gendered on the, on the back of some, me some media hits and some historical things 200 years old. It's so non sequitur. It so does not follow. It's so stupid. These people should have no audience. Five. Systems of Scientific Domination. Feminist glaciology builds on feminist postcolonial science studies. We're not even to the fun part of the paper yet, by the way. And feminist political ecology to understand how gender, power, and inequality are embedded in systems of scientific domination. Such power structures maintain glaciology as a discipline concentrated in the wealthy, developed world, often termed the global north, with generally weak institutional representation from the developing world or indigenous communities. You mean where resources are? Amazing. This pattern exists for global climate uh, simulations in general, which are conducted by European and North American scientists with little to no representation from Central and South America, Africa, the Middle East, or South Asia. I wonder how much the Middle East has to say about the fucking glaciers there. The feminist lens is crucial for effective analysis of what might look on the feminist lens is crucial for effective analysis of what might look on the surface like post-colonial or hegemonic structures of development. Oh, about you mean glacier things? No, about sociology things, post-colonial and hegemonic structures of development. But global power imbalances and gender inequality co-constitute each other. Oh, of course they do. They're intersectional. And the natural sciences and glaciology in particular. Current climate change discussions, for example, perpetuate power discrepancies through what Israel and Sachs 2013 refer to as, quote, the centrality of mathematical and technological science structured by masculinist ideologies of domination and mastery. Yeah, yes, mathematical and technological things are bad, right? When you're trying to do science, 
thus determining who can or cannot participate in climate science and policymaking because those poor girls and their pretty little heads can't do the computers. So that's, they're too busy worried about if they're going to look pretty when they're out on the ice. Such institutional, cultural, and scientific practices also affect glaciological knowledge. While there are on paper few recognized glaciologists from the global south, see one of the author's previous papers for exceptions, such recognition is predicated upon a specific type of knowledge production that is restricted to a group of scientists who cannot, who often cannot be divorced from larger processes of colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy, and capitalist resource extraction. Only people who would care about that are communists. Questions of who produces glaciological knowledge and how such knowledge is used or shared turn out to have lots to do with who has the resources to be able to do them or is hooked into resource Okay, but no, that's not what they're going to say. Take on real implications when considered through feminist post-colonial science studies and feminist political ecology lenses. Specifically, the feminist approach opens up marginalized knowledge and exposes how larger structures of domination have worked historically to suppress certain voices. It reveals how people across the planet have been living with glaciers for centuries and have produced wide ranges of glaciological knowledge folk glaciology that is rarely recognized within the scientific discipline of modern glaciology. We use the term folk glaciology to refer to the significant glacier-oriented knowledges produced at different times and places by diverse peoples, cultures, and social groups. Let me just pause again. Have you heard anything yet that would actually improve glacier science? Have you heard any glacier science at all? No, of course you haven't. You certainly have not. All you have heard is sociological nonsense. You've not heard a single thing has anything to do with it. Just pointing that out again. For example, no, sorry, it says for instance. We want to be true. For instance, in Canada's Yukon Territory, glacier knowledge of elder indigenous women has both a gendered context and offers alternative visions of ice compared to Western sciences. Cruikshank, 2005, explains for Northwest North America that knowledge of the landscape is influenced profoundly by culture, gender, age, and personal experiences of each individual living with glaciers. Additionally, whereas glaciologists may try to measure glaciers and understand ice physics by studying the glacial ice itself, indigenous accounts do not portray the ice as passive to be measured and mastered in a stereotypically masculinist sense. We're going to get to the fun stuff. Quote, The glaciers these women speak of, explains Cruikshank, engage all the senses. The glaciers are willful, capricious, easily excited by human intemperance, but equally placated by quick-witted human responses. Proper behavior is deferential. I was warned, for instance, about firm taboos against cooking with grease near glaciers that are offended by such smells. Cooked food, especially fat, might grow into a glacier overnight if improperly handled. Cooked food might grow into a glacier overnight if improperly handled. So those are superstitions. But those are alternative knowledges. The narratives Cruikshank collected show how humans and nature are intimately linked. No, it shows how people have superstitions, and subsequently demonstrate the capacity of folk glaciologies to diversify the field of glaciology and subvert the the hegemony of natural sciences. Okay, so here's our first bid towards something to explicitly given to improve the science of glaciology, other than referencing the librarians and uh, mentioning the guy's wife and uh, interviewing women who live near ice that don't know what's going on and don't know why they're being interviewed. Um, is that we have to include these stereotypes, that cooking with grease near glaciers that are offended by such smells can be dangerous because this food itself, cooked food, especially fat, might grow into a glacier overnight if improperly handled. Okay, and what's that supposed to do? How how is incorporating superstition supposed to improve the science of glaciology? Because it says that. It says, demonstrate the capacity of folk glaciologies to diversify the field of glaciology and subvert the hegemony of natural sciences. Oh, that's how. It undermines the existing authority and credibility of science by saying, here's this thing you didn't consider. What we're seeing here 
You remember when we went through Paulo Freire? I know that not everybody listens to all my podcast. Remember when we went through Paulo Freire and he said that you conscientize, and once you have conscientization or once you're conscious, critically conscious, that what you're going to do is denounce the world in order to announce the possibility of a new world, but you don't actually say what the new world's going to look like because then you would impose that and that would be right wing. But the whole of critical consciousness is to denounce whatever is in a way that announces the possibility of a new world. That's all this paper's doing. All they've done so far is denounce stuff that's somehow relevant or tangential or connected to or proceeding from glaciology as a means to announce a new possibility for glaciology that would do what? Diversify the field and subvert the hegemony of natural science. In other words, decrease the credibility of that which is at the center and its authority so that you can move things that are on the margin into the center, which, like I said earlier, will be mostly activists. There'll be some people that are getting used by the activists so that it looks okay. Such knowledge diversification, they say, however, can meet resistance as folk glaciologies challenge existing power dynamics and cultures of control within glaciology. This is one of my favorite parts of this paper. This is where I really started to fall apart when I was reading this thing the first time, though. For instance, in response to Cruikshank's detailed and highly acclaimed research, geographer Cole Harris suggested instead that Cruikshank attributed too much weight to, quote, native stories, and non-scientific understandings of glaciers. He questioned the relevance of indigenous narratives about sentient glaciers in today's modern world by explaining how he consulted a colleague, quote, an expert on snow, about why glaciers advanced rapidly or surged. The expert, quote, spoke of groundwater friction and the laws of physics. Is it possible, I, Harris, asked, that they surge because they don't like the smell of grease? He looked at me blankly, slowly shook his head, and retreated into his office, end quote. Harris is asking what place indigenous knowledge and storytelling have in the world. So that's a big reframing, isn't it? Is it relevant to glaciology? No, because it's superstition. But what it actually is, he's asking what place indigenous knowledge and storytelling have in the world. Well, sort of, but the implication of this reframing is that, in fact, by not including it in glaciology, they're saying that it is that the indigenous storytelling do, shouldn't exist, which it's not science, but that doesn't like ugh. it doesn't matter whether it exists actually. If that's part of their culture, that's great, and they should be they can celebrate their culture, and their culture can last as long as it lasts. Cultures rise and fall throughout the world, it's what happens, but it's not science. And this isn't what it's questioning or bringing up. So this is a disingenuous manipulation being forwarded in here. Although his other work has examined indigenous understandings and uses of local space, nature, and resources, for example, Harris 2002, in the case of his Cruikshank critique, Harris seemed uncomfortable accepting that knowledge is situated in particular places and contexts. Like Donna Haraway said, that values uh, and morals related to ice vary across cultures. And that, as Cruikshanks illustrates quite clearly, glaciological mapping and other scientific research existed within and facilitated systems of colonial expansion, capitalist resource extraction, and the subjugation of indigenous peoples in the region. Let's just go back and read the fun part before we come back to this part. Let me find where it starts. Uh... Cole Harris suggested instead that Cruikshank attributed too much weight to native stories and non-scientific understandings of glaciers. He questioned the relevance of indigenous narratives about sentient glaciers in today's modern world by explaining how he consulted a colleague, an expert on snow, about why glaciers advanced rapidly or surged. The expert spoke of groundwater, friction, and the laws of physics. Is it possible, I, Harris, asked, that they surge because they don't like the smell of grease. He looked at me blankly, slowly shook his head, and relate and retreated into his office. So therefore, that's a big problem, according to Cruikshank. It must be emphasized that Cruikshank does not advocate a simple inclusion of local or indigenous knowledge into Western knowledge or global technocratic or bureaucratic practice. Or, you see, the more big words they're using all of a sudden, the more likely it's bullshit. But you already heard the secret move, right? The appeal to complexity. Cruikshank does not advocate a simple inclusion. It's a complicated one that requires experts to facilitate it. Hire us. 
It must be emphasized that Cruikshank does not advocate a simple inclusion of local or indigenous knowledge into Western knowledge or a global technocratic or bureaucratic practice, arguing that this systematizing, quote, can set in motion processes that fracture and fragment human experience. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of science, apparently. It's about whether it fractures and fragments human experience. But lots of big words all of a sudden in an appeal to complexity. You can always tell there's a power grab happening there. Conscious of this position, the feminist glaciology framework asks that researchers accept a plurality of knowledges and recognize embedded systems of domination. See, the glaciologist who shook his head about Greece instead of actual physics was wrong, and he should accept a plurality of knowledges like these superstitions of sentient glaciers that don't like the smell of Greece and recognize embedded systems of dominance like the ones that he has that prevent him from accepting that. The goal is neither to force glaciologists to believe that glaciers listen, nor make indigenous peoples put their full faith in scientists' mathematical equations and computer-generated models, devoid of meaning, spirituality, and reciprocal human-nature relationships. Rather, the goal is to understand that environmental knowledge is always based in systems of power discrepancies and unequal social relations, and overcoming these disparities requires accepting that multiple knowledges exist and are valid within their own context. Let's rephrase that a little more clearly. Okay, ready? The goal is neither to force glaciologists to believe that glaciers listen, nor make indigenous peoples put their full faith in scientific mathematical equations and computer-generated models. Big list of bad things. Let's back up. The goal is, here are two opposing things, glaciology and indigenous shit. The goal isn't to make either, p- either side accept anything. It's to reframe it in terms of a dialectic in which they're on a higher level of understanding, one of which is devoid of meaning, spirituality, and reciprocal human and nature relationships. Instead, the goal is to sublate this to a higher level of understanding where environmental knowledge is understood to always be based in power dynamics and power discrepancies and unequal social relations that are going to have to be adjusted for, by the way, and overcoming these disparities requires accepting that multiple knowledges, so the superstition as one form of knowledge and the science as another form of knowledge, are actually both forms of knowledge. And we're understanding knowledge in a higher level of knowing. We're going to sublate the concept of knowledge. We're going to alfhaben the concept of knowledge, take it to a higher level, while destroying the content of what actually makes it knowledge. We're going to erase the particulars and understand the two as part of a unified whole. Superstition and science are part of a unified whole. Turns out that's the same thesis as the dialectic of enlightenment, but they digress. While folk glaciologies were often marginalized through Western colonialism, the the discipline of glaciology experienced growth and support as a result of European and U.S. imperialism and geopolitical expansion. See, they mentioned the bad stuff that came out as a result already before, because they need to make the existing kind look morally bad. So the goal is that you're going to lift them up so that they're on the same level in a new way. There are both kinds of knowledge, but one has all these moral downsides, and one is conscious of how it would avoid those moral downsides. Therefore, it's actually superior. That's how they actually invert, and the superstition now becomes superior to existing knowledge. First, you claim that they have to be understood on a high, on an equal level, or else you're a sexist, a racist, a whateverist. And then once you get them there, you say, well, the one you're doing has all these moral issues attached to it. You know, it's excluding women, it's ignoring, you know, indigenous perspectives, it's linked to colonialism, imperialism, geopolitical expansion, resource extraction, which are already highly gendered projects in themselves in turn, helping to materially and discursively undergird those projects. The United States, for example, had an overwhelmingly militarized relationship with the polar regions in the early Cold War period. See, more making the existing side morally questionable. You put them on an epistemological level that they don't deserve through the dialectic. The two things that are in opposition are actually parts of the same thing. We only think that they're opposed because we don't understand a higher level understanding where they're actually constituent parts of the same thing. That's the dialectic. That I know that's a complicated concept, but that's the dialectic. That these things that seem different are actually part of the same thing. And that's knowledge broadly construed. And so you put them on a level and then you point out that, well, in a second dimension of analysis, morally, 
the one that we're that, that you've been holding up is actually bad, and the one that we're now forwarding is actually good because it's conscious of all. It's not because of his good in and of itself, but because it's conscious of all of the bad things and seeks to unmake those. It doesn't seek to make something good itself. It never talks about that. You denounce in order to announce the possibility of something better. You don't announce your own project. And that's what's going on here. The United States, for example, had an overwhelmingly militarized relationship with the polar regions in the early Cold War period, from which glaciology benefited immensely, gaining institutional resources, growth, standing, and credibility. The U.S. Antarctic operations high jump and windmill in the late 1940s were intended to prepare the military for conflicts in cold regions. The process constituting for U.S. scientists especially a regionally expensive, expansive sorry, and technologically driven domination of the South Polar region. Oh yeah, so it turns out when you have reasons why you might do something, you put re- resources into them. The U.S. had a similar, similarly militarized relationship with the Arctic. In 1949, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Emil Beaudry convinced his superiors that as Greenland was likely to be the, quote, avenue of approach for untold destruction and unless guarded could well spend, well spell doom for the United States as a nation, end quote, whichever country was able to, quote, completely master Greenland would possess a new weapon that could not be countered or molested, end quote. Mastering and defending Greenland, however, required mastering its ice sheet, and new glaciological knowledge was only possible with the resources available to the U.S. military. In 1949, Henry Bader, Henry Bader, Henri, I don't know, the chief scientist for the U.S. government's snow, ice, and permafrost research establishment, CIPRA, uh, complained that while there was general knowledge of the location and easily discernible characteristics of glaciers, more complex and sophisticated knowledge of their physical processes was poor. The substantial growth of glaciology in subsequent decades relied to an important degree on these military demands, the militarization of the polar regions, and the intellectual and institutional growth of glaciology were part of broader U.S. geopolitical visions and strategies during the Cold War, which were pursued by a particular group of men as policymakers who were products of specific elite masculinities. Operating in the context of anxieties about American masculinities and with particular discourses of masculinity in male bodies, especially in distant places like the Arctic. Yet again, let me just summarize what's really going on with this paper. It is how the dialectic works. You take different forms of knowledge that seem to be opposed to one another. In this case, science, and then this kind of mishmash, useful mishmash of Indigenous superstition and feminism, which is a politically activist thing, and become that's the mishmash. You mix those together so that you kind of it's like putting a pill inside of a inside of like a hot dog for a dog. The indigenous stuff is the hot dog, and the pill is the feminism that's actually going to do something. And you feed it to the dog and hope it swallows it. And the dog is science. What you're actually going to do is you're going to take those two different things. And you're going to make pretend that they're actually on a level that you can only understand if you have a higher level understanding. Knowledge is more broadly construed. So they're both knowledges. That they've been dialectically sublated. These opposing things, which is this combination of indigenous knowledge hiding a political activist core. That thing is equal to science. As long as you stop understanding it on a low first stand level and lift up to a higher for nunft level of what knowledge really represents in an expanded consciousness kind of way. That's sublation. That's Alfhaben. Once you do that, so now you have them on a level with regard to knowing, you then morally obliterate the one you want to conquer. All this is is page after page after page after page after stories of moral uh, st- stories of reasons why there are moral questions and moral problems surrounding how glacier studies have been done. Glaciology was funded for military research in the Cold War and masculine energy, blah, blah, blah. So you make it look really bad. They're already on a level. It has nothing to do with rigor anymore because that's only a low level for stand understanding of what's going on. When you go into a critical for an level of understanding, their knowledges are actually the same you know, feminist poison pill tucked inside of an indigenous hot dog and the thing that's going to eat it equal the same. They're going to be brought together. The dog's going to eat the hot dog. They're going to be one thing. 
and it's going to be digested. They're all one thing already, okay? The, maybe the hot dog thing. So it's not so good. But the the idea here is that you are going to elevate the superstition with a feminist poison pill inside of it. That's a knowledge. That's a that's diverse knowledges, and you have this limited exclusive knowledge that's like a special form of bourgeois property that needs to be abolished through this sublation process. So now you have them on a level, but the one you're already doing is morally evil. And then they send page after page after page after page saying why there's moral problems with it so that it can be beaten on grounds because it cannot, it's not equal in rigor. So the first step is you use sublation to remove the particulars. In other words, rigorous methods versus non-rigorous methods like superstition and activism. So you first sublate by destroying those particulars and saying, oh, well, the essence is that they're both kinds of knowledge. You keep the essence and destroy the particulars, like rigor versus not rigor. That's a binary. That's bad. So you destroy that. And then you morally obliterate. Now that you have them on a level, you morally obliterate the one you want to get rid of. And then you say, well, our program is morally superior because we're not because we're particularly pro anything good, but because we're against all those bad things. That's the trick. That's how they conquer everything. And they call it the next word, the first words of the next sentence. Structures of power and domination also stimulated the first large-scale ice core drilling projects. These archetypal masculinist projects to literally penetrate glaciers, literally penetrate like sex, right? Like rape. And extract from measurement and exploitation the ice in Greenland and Antarctica. These ice cores, which have revealed glacial interglacial cycles, that's what it says, glacial, glacial interglacial cycles, and validated trajectories of both climate change and anthropogenic warming also began as a part of American and Soviet Cold War geostrategic projections into the polar regions. The first ice core from Camp Century in Greenland emerged from a drilling program begun in 1959, even before Willie Dansgaard introduced a method, for, a method of isotope analysis for paleoclimates. Ice coring, in other words, began with a military purpose, but eventually found a scientific function. Okay, so. But that means it's been morally obliterated. It was actually, it started with a morally questionable thing, right? The even longer ice cores from Vostok in the center of the East Antarctic ice sheet began with similar geostrategic strategic motives. The Soviet Union was trying to exert its control of Antarctica by establishing the Vostok station at the, quote, pole of relative inaccessibility, the furthest point from the sea in Antarctica. Ice core drilling at Vostok began in the late 1950s, and by the 1980s, the core offered a longer climactic record than the first Camp Century core, and clearly demonstrated the links between carbon dioxide levels and past temperatures. These ice cores were born in the, con in the contest for scientific authority and geostrategic control of the polar regions, moral failure, manifesting the centrality of power, conquest, and national security in the history of glaciological knowledge. It glaciologists study this for other reasons entirely. They don't care why they have the ice core. They just know they have the ice core and they study it and find out facts. But now they're conflating those things to morally undermine the glaciology that doesn't care about the reason by claiming that it only has that because of the reason. And so the reason is magically implicated in the glaciology. So therefore we need a feminist glaciology that's going to replace that evil glaciology. I'm telling you, this is what they do. This is all frustrating to read, but that's all it really boils down to. The, this is hundreds of, this is thousands of words to achieve what I just said in a sentence. The military and geopolitical dimensions of glaciers persist today, albeit in different forms, that illustrate the importance of feminist glaciology extending, quote, beyond gender to other aspects of inequality, power knowledge, dynamics, and imperialism. Power knowledge is hyphenated, just like with Foucault. But here again, the same thing. Now, are you noticing what it does? It says, here's this historical problem. Now, here's a reason in the contemporary era why it's still happening. In the previous section, they did, here's these historical stories about masculine gender explorer, or glacier explorers. And, it, and now here are some stories from the New York Times and a documentary about why that kind of attitude still exists, even though it's not in the science at all. You see what they're doing? So here they said, oh, back in the military in the Cold War, this is what's going, but this is still happening. In official U.S. discourse, retreating glaciers are framed as threats to national security and international stability. 
which is also one of the main reasons that they give for caring about climate change, by the way. So they're going to have it both ways. And therefore, knowledge of ice is essential to maintaining geopolitical power. Retreating glaciers rank with drought, flooding, sea level rise, and epidemics as, cr as critical threats to United States national security. Former CIA Director R. James Woolsey explained, did I say that right? Yeah, Woolsey explained when he testified before the United States House of Representatives in February 2019 that, quote, one of the fastest set of melting glaciers is apparently in the Andes. And if we think we have trouble coming up with a sound and agreed upon immigration policy for the United States now, what is it going to be like for our southern, if our southern borders are seeing millions of our hungry and thirsty southern neighbors headed toward temperate climates? For Woolsey, the U.S. national security hinges on increased knowledge of glaciers, much as it was integral to Canadian and U.S. expansion into the Yukon and Alaska in the 19th century, as well as to Soviet and U.S. strategists in the early Cold War years. Systems of domination and, the structures, of, and structures of power and patriarchy have long fed the production of glaciological knowledge. That's a real stretch from what they just said, but okay. Now we get fun. Six. Alternative representations. This is like, at this point, I'm just like, what the fuck is this paper when I'm reading through this six years ago? But now, now it goes. Alternative representations. If the intersecting forces of colonialism, neoliberalism, and patriarchy, see again, buzzword salad, so we're thinking we can hoax these people, have historically silenced and marginalized. So buzzword salad did buzzword salad of bad things, so the buzzword salad of activist shit. That's the formula. If the intersecting forces of colonialism, neoliberalism, and patriarchy have historically silenced and marginalized certain ways of knowing and types of knowledge produced by particular groups such as women or indigenous people, then feminist glaciology, drawing from feminist political ecology and feminist postcolonial science studies, seeks to expose those more than science voices, more than science vo voices, and offer a diversity of representations of cryoscapes. So we're out of the cryosphere and back to the cryoscape. Researchers across a range of disciplines have increasingly advocated for, for greater plurality. Researchers across a range of disciplines. Did glaciologists do that? No. Researchers across a range of disciplines have increasingly advocated for greater plurality and knowledge about and representations of global environmental change. Remember when we said that that was just a political project? Oh, yeah. Castry et al. 2014, for example, contended that, quote, other forms of knowledge, discourse, and understanding beyond the natural sciences must be appropriately, sorry, must be properly acknowledged, Alfhaven, sublate, precisely because they both affect and are affected by science and technology. These forms range beyond the cognitive to, the, to encompass the moral, spiritual, aesthetic, and affective. That's A, affective, not effective, emotional. These calls align with those of feminist political ecology and feminist postcolonial science studies. No shit. Who do you think probably wrote that garbage? That seek to unsettle dominant Western assumptions, narratives, and representations, which tend to privilege the natural sciences. So we just saw an example of idea laundering, by the way. Here's this thing we're citing that's written by people who are the exact same kind of activists as us, and that agrees with exact same kind of activists as us. Therefore, this is something lots of people are talking about. And when Trump said many people are saying, people laughed but this is the exact same idea, uh, except it's not many people are saying, it's just them citing each other. This is idea laundering. This is academic inbreeding. This is intellectual incest. And I don't exaggerate at all. But what's their goal again? They seek to unsettle dominant Western assumptions, narratives, and representations, which tend to privilege the natural sciences. Mm-hmm. They want to unseat the authority and credibility of the natural sciences so they can move their activism into its place and often emerge through the co-constituted processes of colonialism, patriarchy, and unequal power relations, again citing Sandra Harding, but that tend to emerge through all these moral failures. Once you lift up, you sublate, you alfhaben, you lift up to a higher level and understand that knowledge is knowledge is knowledge. It doesn't matter what kind it is or how, how you got it. It's still knowledge. And what are you going to do? Be a chauvinist and say some other knowledge like activism or indigenous superstition? is? Are you going to be a chauvinist and say that that's not the same as your rigorously derived mathematical and scientific knowledge? You chauvinist, you jerk, you pig. And the thing that you're doing by discrediting that is really just trying to uphold a power dynamic that does all these terrible things like colonials and patriarchy, unequal power relations, geopolitical strategy, blah, blah, blah. You guys are actually really bad people. And so you lift up to where knowledge means 
something very, 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 very broad that fits in your activism and the hot dog that the pill is tucked in. And then you say those things are actually equal, except you guys are moral failures. Dominant narratives can erase local, regional, and even national variation in the diversity of perspectives, including those of women and other material, uh, marginalized people. More of the same. Feminist political ecologists have thus sought, they're our heroes, right? Have, have thus sought to use innovative research methods such as storytelling, narrative, literature, and the visual arts to, quote, go beyond gender to find new voices discussing and representing global environmental change. Now, this is at the point where I didn't, I was not familiar with this in 2016 when I read this paper the first time, and I was like, what? Storytelling? Narrative, literature, and visual arts? But science, I was not ready for this. I was so confused and getting angry. Feminist glaciology promotes alternative glacier representations, which include folk glaciologies, and calls uh, for transdisciplinary knowledge integration and methodology, which is crucial for putting glacier knowledges into their human contexts. So remember from the UNESCO document what transdisciplinarity meant. It meant that we're going to bring the arts, the, sci uh, the, arts, the humanities, and the social sciences to bear on the natural sciences. It means that you're going to go across disciplinary boundaries. You're going to Alfhaven disciplinary disciplines themselves. The natural sciences and the social sciences and humanities aren't actually opposed. They're all part and parcel of the same thing, knowledge production. And so the scientists are going to have to stop worrying so much about their rigorous methods and start incorporating other ways of knowing. And that's in the name of transdisciplinarity. That's what it meant. What it means is the strange death of science, and that's why I kept referring back to this paper in that episode of the podcast. In contrast to trends in masculinist glaciology, one example of alternative glacier representations includes glacier-oriented visual and literary arts, which are particularly illustrative of how ice may be meaningful and significant beyond common efforts of control and domination. Oh, so we can get away from efforts of con control and domination and studying glaciers by including glacier-oriented visual and literary arts. Remember, we're talking about the science of glaciology. So now we're getting to ways to improve the science of glaciology, and it seems that we have to include glacier-oriented visual and literary arts into the science of glaciology. And this is the part where I just was like, what? What is going on? But now I know. Transdisciplinarity is going on. Alf Haben of the natural sciences is going on. They're destroying the natural sciences to lift them up to science in the general sense of knowledge production. And then we have the, they, I should say, have the enlightened Gnostic version that's morally virtuous and calling out all of the moral depredation and uh, depravity of the existing system. That's the trick. Get it in your head. You'll see it everywhere. Visual and literary arts reposition and re-envision glaciers as greater than their usual status. Alfhaben, sublate, again, they obliterate the boring, mundane details, and they lift them up to a higher level of understanding. They reposition and re-envision glaciers as greater than their usual status as passive research subjects and into various cultural fields compi comprised of social myths, images, characters, performances, and artworks. Artists including Ressa Blattman, Zaria Foreman, Camille Seaman, Spencer Tunick, Claudia Martzendorfer, and Joan Perlman articulate new narratives of human glacier relationships by approaching ice through feeling and affect, emotional response, sense of place, the personal and the intimate, kinship and family, rather than through the attributes and characteristics of the dominant masculinist scientific glaciology, often characterized by control, prediction, ice penetration, that's right, measurement, and quantification. Many of the examples below from the visual and literary arts veer away from the more typically masculinist Sorry, the more typical masculinist representations of glaciers by offering alternative gendered ice depictions. Do you see where it's going? We're finally getting to our suggestions of how to improve glaciology, and it's to include fucking art projects and stories. For instance, Scottish visual artist Katie Patterson's 2007 work, 
that's not something I can read. It's like an Icelandic longical scenario. I don't even know what that letter is. Whatever. Depicts the impermanence of glaciers while broadening the notion of glaciers as repositories for climactic records and diverting what it means to, quote, record and to be a record. This is awesome. Patterson chronicled the ordinary sounds of the Longical, Snaffelsjokul, and Solheimjokul glaciers in Iceland. I was right. It was Icelandic. Uh, So Patterson chronicled the ordinary sounds of three glaciers in Iceland and then transferred the audio tracks to long-playing micro-groove vinyl, quote, ice records. Records created by casting and freezing the glacier's own meltwater. She then played the frozen records simultaneously on three turntables as they melted. The audio recordings available at, and I have not checked to see if this is the case, but you can go look for yourself. The audio recordings available at www.k-a-t-i-e-p-a-t-e-r-s-o-n.org slash ice records. So Katie, Katie Patterson, but it's one T in Patterson, dot org slash ice records, fuse glacier sounds with the high whine of the ice record itself. After 10 minutes, the actual ice LP record deteriorates and the sound melts away. Climactic data from ice, cores rec- ice core records are often imported into climate models. While rates of glacier retreat chronicling meters melted per year are usually taken directly at face value with policy implications. Both the ice cores and ice loss measurements feed homogenizing global narratives of glaciers with somewhat restricted views of the cryosphere, no longer cryoscape, lacking emotional and sensory interactions with the ice that occurs in Patterson's artworks. Patterson and other artists thus intervene in such, quote, truths by presenting purposefully imprecise social and scientific methodologies and works. That's what you, that, there's an art project. So uh, the glacier makes sounds, so you record the sounds, and then you put the sounds on a record that's made out of the ice, out of the melting water off of the glacier. And then you pl- to give people an emotional experience, you play those sounds on the ice records, which also whine as they turn and they melt and people watch them melt and the sound falls apart. And so they get this visceral experience of the destruction of the glacier and its sounds and its personality. And that's necessary because if you just, you know, measure them, that is a homogenizing view that doesn't include social tr- or these other truths that are purposefully imprecise, social and scientific methodologies and works. That's not a scientific methodology, it's a fucking art project. There's nothing wrong with an art project, it's just not science. Patterson's artwork builds on an earlier project where she submerged a phone line connected to Vajnajukul, Iceland, and Europe's largest glacier. People could call the glacier, again, I've never tried this, but you're welcome to, it's a British phone number, plus 44 parentheses 0775 and listen to the distinctive pops, trills, and gurgles of the ice. More than 10,000 people called during the installation. Such a project demonstrates how the social constructions of space, time, and knowledge can be manipulated in significant ways and can engage the human senses. Patterson's work challenges the conceits of scientific distance and impartiality. Glaciers are no longer remote, but just a phone call away. These interactions and acquaintances with the ice diverge from the more masculinist domination of the glaciers in polar colonial science, ice core extraction, and quantification. So there's a way, a sec, there's two ways, two art projects by this one person, Katie Patterson, that you can do. You can make records out of the ice and let people listen to it, or you can hook it up to a phone and let people call the glacier and talk to it on the phone. Other artists offer alternative glacier representations by melting, or sorry, melding science and art. In Columbia Glacier 4, 1990, USGS 2011, landscape painter Diane Burko depicts a realistic image of a white-yellow, thickly painted glacier pouring into a dark foreground. Okay, so we have a painting of a glacier. The prominent red stylized timestamp in the lower right corner is evocative of common scientific images of glaciers. Juxtap- so she painted a picture that looks like a scientific picture, including with a digital timestamp painted there. 
Okay. Juxtaposing a clearly painted glacier. No, 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 pardon me. Let me say that correctly. Juxtaposing a clearly, quote, painted glacier, Burko blurs the lines of authority and science, pushing viewers to consider how glacier narratives are produced, circulated, and even credibility and authority across time and space, and by whom. I'm sorry, and given credibility and authority across time and space, and by whom. Her paintings which utilize up-to-date scientific data, such as individual glacier recession rates, inhabit a socially problematic more-than-science position of being simultaneously, quote, representationally accurate, but also, quote, representationally artistic. They thus challenge dominant structures of authority and hegemonic knowledge construction, because in more formal scientific glaciology, these positions are often treated as mutually exclusive. Burko also paints glaciers from an aerial top-down perspective one that appropriates a gaze generally associated with scientific credibility and accuracy. Let me freeze for a second, freeze, haha, and just remind you what we're talking about. See, there's a feminist woman who paints glaciers and makes them look scientifically accurate, but the scientists think of her paintings as art and don't study them like they study the photographs of glaciers that they have. And that's a problem. But now she sometimes paints them from the top down, appropriating a gaze, good lord, appropriating a gaze generally associated with scientific credibility and accuracy. You know, like satellite pictures, I told you. Such a gaze has been troubled by feminist researchers who argue that the, quote, conquering gaze makes an implicit claim on who has the power to see and not be seen. Lots of uh, citations, including Sandra Harding. Burko's aerial paintings additionally interact with common representations of glaciers through images constructed with GIS and satellite technologies. Garb, 1994, applies a, applies a feminist science studies lens to consider this a, quote, distant view, sorry, to consider this, quote, distant view as masculine, reminiscent of detached, voyeuristic, pornographic images. Burko's glacier paintings challenge assumptions about expertise. Who has access to sorry, who has access to and knowledge of such technologies that determine widely circulated glacier representations? Okay, so for example, people who take pictures of glaciers from satellites have access to a technology, but Diane Burko or whatever the fuck her name is, paints pictures of them. Same thing. Same damn thing. Same damn thing. It challenges Assumptions about ex- expertise. Who has access to a knowledge of such technologies? See, because there's these pictures from the satellites, but you could just paint that shit. About local knowledge. Much messier and complicated than satellite imagery. Oh, complicated, really? Hmm. And about universalism, where Earth systems and satellite representations obscure on-the-ground details and context. Don't forget that it said that it is a detached, voyeuristic, and pornographic thing to use a satellite to take a picture of a glacier. Because Garb, 1994, using a feminist science studies lens, said so. More broadly, however, Burko's work contests the perceived gulf between art and science itself. Glacier, Glacier artwork does teach about glaciology, even if it's not a satellite, even if it's not satellite image from, quote, true satellites. Do you start to understand how this paper radicalized me into deciding that we should do something about the state of academic literature in these activist domains? Are you starting to get it? So, so far, how do we improve glacier science? Well, apparently we have to listen to indigenous myths. We have to interview women who live near glaciers who don't know what's going on. We need to do art projects like freezing glaciers into records that play glacier noises until they melt, letting people hook up a phone line and call the glacier on the phone, feminist art painting projects of glaciers, which glacier artwork does teach about glaciology because Burko's work contests the perceived gulf between art and science itself. Glacier artwork does teach about glaciology even if it is not satellite imagery from, quote, true satellites. See, it's the same. If you just relinquish your low-level for stand understanding of science and glaciology, the satellite images in a painting that looks like satellite images are the same. 
and science is sexist because it doesn't think so. It prefers the actual pornographic satellite image. That's what this paper says. Let's continue. In addition to glacier artwork, there is also a growing body of literature that expands understandings of the cryosphere, again, we're still not back to the cryos cryoscape yet, and grapples with core issues in feminist geography. Uzma Aslam, uh, sorry, it's not the whole name, Usla Aslam Khan's 2010 short story, Ice, quote, <laughs> Ice, comma, mating. Ice, mating. For example, explores religious nationalistic, it's a short story, explores religious, nationalistic, and colonial themes in Pakistan, while also featuring intense sexual symbolism of glaciers acting upon a landscape. Okay, it's a short story about glaciers engaging in intense sexual symbolism on a landscape. Khan writes, quote, It was Farhana who told me that Pakistan has more glaciers than, out than anywhere outside of the poles, and I've seen them. I've even seen them fuck. Khan, 2010, emphasis in the original. I've even seen them F-U-C-K. I've seen the glaciers. I've seen them have sex. This fictional story draws from local understandings of Karakoram uh, geomorphology, their cultures of glaciers and mountains, and the gendered nature of landscape perceptions, and the legacies of colonialism. In Khan's story, glacier knowledge, while highly sexualized, is acquired through locals in Khan's story. Glacier knowledge, while highly sexualized, is acquired through locals' interactions with the surrounding glaciers rather than through classic Western channels of knowledge dissemination through reports and academic articles. Khan subverts traditional roles of who acts upon whom, complicating patriarchal assumptions that, as with society, nature must have rulers and the ruled. Khan also points to the long tradition of local women, women interacting with glaciers in early Western-funded glaciological expeditions into the Karakaram by explicitly highlighting women's roles in producing glaciological knowledge, the story simultaneously avoids and points out the common practice of, quote, erasure, in which the full range of participants in the production of scientific knowledge, in this case women in glaciology, is ignored or overlooked. So this is a woman writing a story about glaciers in Pakistan that's claiming that she watches them have sex, and that somehow does something important to the science of glaciology. The American science fiction and fantasy author, author Ursula K. Le Guin, mm -hmm, has also explored ice and glaciers in several of, several of her works. The novel The Left Hand of Darkness, Le Guin 1969, upends notions of gender while reimagining masculine and polar exploration. The novel sends two figure t uh, fugitives. By the way, that the um, glaciers having sex thing is in the TED Talk video. I don't know if it's even clearly referenced that the glaciers having sex thing in the video because she shows pictures of so-called male and female glaciers right before that. M. Jackson does. I don't recall. It's been a while since I've watched the video, but uh, I don't know if she tells you that that was based in a fictional story or not. It's, it's so insane that this, I mean, again, $500,000 of National Science Foundation money almost. So now we're back to Ursula K. Le Guin. She upends notions of gender while reimagining masculine polar exploration. The novel sends two. The novel is the Left Hand of Darkness. The novel sends two fugitives on an eighty-one day journey across the Gobrin Glacier on a fictional planet of winter. Good God! In a frozen world without warfare, Le Guin imagines a place without men and women, where there are no fixed or different sexes. In her nineteen eighty-two short story, Sir S U R. Le Guin portrays a group of South American women who reached the South Pole two years before the all-male Amundsen, uh, Amund, Amundsen, I can't even say anything anymore, Amundsen and Scott parties. But these women leave no record of their activities in Antarctica, and upon their return tell nobody of the feat. Such a radical post-colonial feminist narrative about polar exploration serves to underscore the history still perpetuated today, a history imbued with masculinity and heroic men. I don't know what the fuck those stories have to do with anything in the glaciological science, especially since all they deal with is, is Arctic exploration history. 
and literally a fictional planet called Winter. I don't even know what the fuck that... I'm lost. I'm just getting mad reading this shit again. Other literature tackles emotional, psychological, and sexual interactions with glaciers. Did you hear that? Let me just say it again. Other literature tackles emotional, psychological, and sexual interactions with glaciers. Word of the wise, boys. It's cold. Don't put your willy in there. Alexis Smith's 2012 debut novel, Glacier, features a main character who acts both as a metaphor and a voice for the shrinking glaciers that she dreams about vividly and depicts individuals and communities psychological uh, experiences and challenge identities through glacier loss. And Cheryl St. Germain's 2001, quote, To Drink a Glacier, that's the title of the story, the author interprets her experiences with Alaska's Mendenhall Glacier as sexual and intimate. When she drinks the glacier's water, she reflects, quote, that drink is like a kiss, a kiss that takes in the entire body of the other, like some wondrous, omnipotent, liquid tongue touching our own tongues all over the roof and sides of our mouths going ASMR on this, then moving in us and through us to where it knows. I swallow, trying to make the spiritual, sexual sweetness of it last. The fuck is that? God dang, man. What the fuck? The story portrays the glacier's sensual, embodied nature as the main character goes through her own midlife sexual awakening. Mm-hmm. So, fem- glaciology, thanks to feminist glaciology, not only has to incorporate those weirdo art projects and some of these short stories about glaciers having sex and all this stuff, but also stories about how a woman experiences drinking water from a glacier as a sexual thing as she goes through her sexual, her midlife sexual awakening, aka her midlife crisis. I don't know how this is supposed to improve glaciology as a science. What I do understand is how it's supposed to be used as a lever to get activism in the humanities through transdisciplinarity to kill the science of glaciology and to gut it and to wear its skin as a suit as it does activism in the image of glaciology, which is important to climate change research, which is very political. St. Germain Le Guin, Kahn, and many others from Ronnie Horn, 2009, to Polly Couture, 2005, approach glaciers from distant and very disciplinary and artistic spaces compared with glaciologists, or even anthropologists studying human-glacier interactions. Such alternative representations of glaciers are rarely incorporated or even acknowledged within greater discourses of glaciology and global environmental change research. See, they're rarely, they, they rarely incorporate this stuff in glaciology. I have no idea why. I, have, I couldn't think of a single fucking reason why. Yet their voices should not simply be disregarded, overshadowed by Western science, or worse, relegated from policy contexts where, in fact, the human experience with ice matters greatly. Okay, so we have to Alf Haben, we have to abolish and remake science, glaciology as a science, to include this stuff. It should not be... Uh, disregarded and overshadowed by Western science. But the thing that they say is worse than that is being excluded from policy contexts mm-hmm, where they have power. These alternative representations from the visual and literary arts, let me editorialize, don't do a damn thing. My bad. These alternative representations from the visual and literary arts do more than simply offer cross-disciplinary perspectives on the cryosphere. Again, it's still not back to being a cryoscape. Instead, they reveal entirely different approaches, interactions, relationships, perceptions, values, emotions, knowledges, and ways of knowing and interacting with dynamic environments. Uh Uh-oh, just heard a lot of big words and something that sounds very complicated with lots lots and lots of things involved. Better hire an expert. Gonna need a consultant. They decenter the natural sciences. What did I tell you? You have to take out of the center that which is in the center so you can bring that which is in the margin to the center where the power is. What's at the margins? Well, basically, a feminist activist poison pill tucked inside of an indigenous knowledge hot dog that makes it easier to swallow. That's why I said that. Okay? Instead, they reveal entirely different approaches, interactions, blah, 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 blah. They decenter the natural sciences disrupt masculinity, 
deconstruct embedded power structures, depart from homogenous and masculinist narratives about glaciers, and empower and incorporate different ways of seeing, interacting, and representing glaciers, all key goals of feminist glaciology. So let's just go back. Let me reach out to all two glaciologists who might be listening to this, or all 20 of you who might have friends who are glaciologists or scientists of any kind. They said the, they said the quiet part first. They decenter the natural sciences. The goal, the key goal of feminist glaciology or feminist science studies in general is to decenter the natural sciences. In other words, to usurp the credibility and authority of the natural scientists to their activist agenda. This will kill your science. I'm not talking about this paper specifically. These ideas are present all through the UNESCO document that I just went through in a four-part series uh, called The Strange Death of the University, where I said that they, well, I didn't say, they said that the whole point of a university going forward needs to be to achieve the sustainable development goals. This will kill science and replace it with an activist simulacrum, a fake, a counterfeit. This is Lysenkoism. This is the Sovietization. If you are a scientist, the time to fight is now. You will either bend the knee and become a fraud, or you will be excluded if you let this go much longer. 7. Conclusions Ice is not just ice. The dominant way Western societies understand it through the science of glaciology is not a neutral representation of nature because it left out the feminist stuff. The feminist glaciology framework draws attention to those who dominate and frame the production of glaciological knowledge, the gendered discourses of science and knowledge, and the ways in which colonial, military, and geopolitical domination co-constitute glaciological knowledge. Okay. They say this is what well, glaciology is not neutral. It's not a neutral representation of nature and ice. Ice is not just ice. It's more complicated than that. You have to have a Gnostic to tell you what it really means. So there's always biases tucked in. It's always happening. So we are the conscious ones, the Gnostics, who are going to put our bias in on purpose because we're conscious of our bias and we're against all the bad things you're doing unconscious of your bias. That's the grift. That's the trick. That's the lie. This bad thing's always happening. We're going to do it now because it's always going to happen. We're doing it consciously and against all the bad things that you're causing. Even if they don't have... Their idea of a good idea is adding in literature and art. This is insane. Even in a globalized age where the place of women and indigenous people has improved, improved markedly in some parts of the world, masculinist discourses continue to dominate in subtle and determinative ways. Feminist glaciology advocates for a shift of preoccupations in research policy and public perceptions from the physical and seemingly natural to a broader consideration of, oh, quote, cryoscapes. We're back to those. The human and the insights and potentials of alternative ice narratives and folk glaciologies. The critique and framework outlined here illuminate experiences and narratives that emerged historically, that means Marxism, but remain potent today. Mm -hmm. This thing used to be happening, is still happening, because if we take in the totality of historical conditions to understand a thing, we haven't had a revolution, so it's still the same problem. Public discourse on the cryosphere continues to privilege quite explicitly manly endeavors and adventures in the fields. They didn't actually show that. They just said that the, the uh, media depictions of those things do. And they even said that they were saying that because that's what sells, which they were kind of crapping on. And those who conduct their science in the manner of masculinist glaciologists and other field scientists of decades and centuries past. A new documentary by fil French filmmaker uh, Luc Jaquette 2015 about the preeminent French glaciologist and geochemist Claude Laurius uh, perpetuates narratives of heroic domination of nature while in interesting ways noting that quote triumphant man is responsible for the global problems that make Laurius's research so necessary. At the same time, those are your contradictions that have to be exposed and uh, sublated. At the same time, in the midst of extensive coverage of the polar regions in the context of climate change, the New York Times has published articles that foreground the dangerous field in Greenland, sorry, in Greenland, thereby validating manly heroic fieldwork while simultaneously relegating work with models and computers 
to something like uh, armchair glaciology. Unlike past narratives, there are subtleties and tensions within these public discourses, especially as they often seek to see scientific work in more detail, a detail that can soften or undercut the individual exertions on display. However, they still privilege stereotypical and masculinist practices of glaciology. They're just asserting that. Like, none of this really actually supports any of this. Other narratives, however, challenge these practices, thereby generating alternative approaches to ice. Yeah, like stories about having sex with a glacier. Emerging from Australia, the Homeward Bound Initiative plans a, quote, state-of-the-art leadership and strategic program for 78 women in science from around the globe to travel to Antarctica in late 2016. One of its aims being to, quote, explore how women at the leadership table might give us a more sustainable future, end quote. Interesting. The call for feminist glaciology is not limited to ice and glaciers, but is a larger intervention into global environmental change and especially climate change research and policy. See, they're not limited to one science. They have to get all the sciences that have political control levers attached to them. As international negotiations remain stalled and government commitments to change and reform are fitful and seemingly ineffectual, those studying environmental change and aware of its significant effects and dangerous potentials continue to search for ways of stemming the tides of change as well as forming just and equitable global structures for addressing it. There's the power grab. The feminist glaciology framework articulates with these larger quests in at least two ways. Aren't quests bad? First, it repeats the demand for increased presence of humanities and social science perspectives in global environmental change research, policy, and broader public discourse. So you need the humanities and social sciences, where all the communist shit is happening, to take over uh, in global environmental change research policy, 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 and broader public discourse. Many humanities and social science disciplines and subdisciplines have given significant attention to these issues, but there remains boundaries between these analyses and those considered central to the environmental change question. The natural sciences that drive and undergird environmental change policy are often asked by decision makers and the media to speak for society or frame research and policy questions for humanity. But the natural sciences are not equipped to understand the complexities and potentialities of human societies. Oh no, they're going to need political offer, operatives for that. Or to recognize the ways in which science and knowledge have historically been linked to imperial and hegemonic capitalist agendas. Mm -hmm. So can you tell that they're commies? You should be able to tell that they're commies. Feminist glaciology participates in this broader movement by suggesting richer conceptions of human-environment relations, like writing stories about having sex with a glacier, and highlighting the disempowering and forestalling qualities of an unexamined and totalizing science. You know, like the kind where you shake your head when you ask it if Greece causes glaciers to move. Second, we re reiterate totalizing science. Totalizing, like it's, a like it's tyranny. Second, we re reiterate the need not only to appreciate the different differential impacts of environmental change on different groups of people, men and women, rich and poor, north and south, but to understand how the science that guides attempted solutions may in fact perpetuate differences because they are essentially built on and draw their epistemic power from differentiation and marginalization. Going to have to replace it with Soviets. Struggles over authority and legitimacy are in, all over this paper. Wait, no, no, no. It says, this one says, struggles over authority and legitimacy play out in many obvious ways in climate change negotiations. Struggles also happen in less obvious ways, such as writing this paper. No, sorry. Such as in the environmental change research underpinning climate politics. Oh, it is in this paper. Okay. Analysts and practitioners must recognize the ways in which more than scientific, non-Western, non-masculinist modes of knowledge, thinking, and action are marginalized. The response to simplistic ice is just ice discourse is not merely to foreground or single out women and their experiences that would simply perpetuate binaries and boundaries and ignore deeper foundations. Vague. Rather, uh-oh, every time they say rather, you know some bullshit's coming. It is a large, every time they say rather, they're doing a dialectic is what they're doing. Rather, it is a larger integration of human approaches and sensibilities with the existing dominant physical sciences. Oh, it's an integration of humanities and a new sensibility 
like communism or the existing physical sciences. Gotcha. Global environmental change research must pluralize its ontologies, epistemologies, and what a weird word comes next, sensibilities. Remember when Herbert Marcuse wrote the essay on liberation in 1969 and chapter two is called A New Sensibility, and it says we all have to have a new sensibility so that we can have socialism? Huh. Though there is ever-increasing evidence to guarantee future temperature increases, what remains uncertain are the human structures and ideas mobilized to cope with environmental change as well as to forestall potentially worse outcomes. These are activists who are super interested in using climate change as a narrative to push their agenda, but who don't have any scientific chops to be able to do any of it. So they want to have a seat at the table is what this is. If we want to constitute, sorry, if we constitute glaciological and global environmental change research differently, we can constitute our future. Oh, wait, if we seize the means of production, we can transform the future. Huh, that's Marxism. But let me actually read what it says, because that wasn't the end of the sentence. It just splits awkwardly. If we constitute glaciological and global environmental change research differently, we can constitute our future, our gender relations, and our international political relations more justly and equitably. Oh, it was just a statement of communism. The statement of communism, the the paper literally ends with a statement of communism. So this took a little longer than I anticipated. I thought I could do it in two. took three hours. This is your answer. James, what radicalized you? I don't know that radicalization is the right phrase. I think it's that the scales fell from my eyes, but it was this paper. And I I think you just heard why. I think you just heard why. And I want you to understand that I came to this paper as a naive young person with an academic background who greatly respected the academic literature, who greatly respected the sciences, and who couldn't process the fact that there was an academic journal of high repute that had published such a a nonsensical, stupid, ill-informed attack on the sciences. Because I was so young and so naive, in a sense, six years ago, that I did not know that there's a global coordinated effort that we're very far into the maturation of to take over the natural sciences and to use them to achieve certain communist political agendas, and they are very close to succeeding. The logic of this essay, this paper, is repeated exactly in the UNESCO document that I called the end, or the strange death of the university in the podcast that I did about it. The strange death of science, the strange death of knowledge. Those are subtitles of parts three and four. In fact, it begins by saying that sustainability is the red, th- no, sorry, transformation is a red thread that runs through all the sustainability goals. So the first episode was called the red thread. The second episode was called a new sensibility because it actually, through the introduction, describes how sustainability in terms of the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations is meant to be the new sensibility that all higher education institutions are going to bind and orient themselves toward. And then the third uh, episode is about transdisciplinarity, and I called it the strange death of science. And now you can hear very clearly why I invoked this paper repeatedly while going through that. And then the fourth episode was uh, the strange death of knowledge, where all of the knowledge production section of this gets expanded tremendously. But you get a very clear view, and I'll wrap up with this you get a very clear view in this paper of what other ways of knowing looks like. We're talking about the science of glaciology, which if you accept that climate change is a big deal, and I'm not asking you to do that, but the authors of this paper clearly seem to, or it's just a political football for them, I don't know. But let's assume that they are genuine, that they think that climate change is a big deal, an actual existential risk. A lot of people believe that on the left in particular. So if you accept that, their premise is, that we're all doomed unless the science of glaciology, studying the glaciers that are kind of a key indicator, a leading indicator potentially of what's going on with climate change, needs to be rethought, reconstituted to include fucking art projects, weird storytelling, glaciers having sex with one another, People drinking glacier water and thinking that they're and characterizing it as a sexual encounter with the glacier as they go through their midlife sexual awakening as a middle-aged woman. Indigenous mythologies about the sentience of glaciers 
All of that has to somehow get wrapped up in, and the existing glaciologists have to set aside their expertise, set aside their explanations, set aside their claims to kowtow to this horse shit. Now, position yourself as somebody who cares a lot about and is worried about climate change. Maybe you are that person, and that's fine. How the fuck is this going to help? That's how obsessed these act activists are. This isn't going to help. This isn't going to help anything. This is, if climate change is a real existential threat, this is a fucking catastrophe. And that's the main thing that these idiots can think of right now. And it's the main thing that these idiots pushing the sustainability narrative that reproduces exactly the same logic of this paper in a UNESCO document from this year, six years later, it's the exact same logic. It's all these idiots can think of is their political agenda and their seat at the table that they're not qualified to sit at that in fact is a distraction from if the problems are real, solving the problems that need to be solved. And if the problems are not real, they have no capacity to weigh in on. They don't belong there. They deserve to be excluded and then for their attempts to bust in on a room they aren't qualified to be in, they deserve to be marginalized, shut down. If you're a scientist, let me just tell you one last time. The moment has arrived. Your hill to die on is here. It actually was here in 2016. You just didn't know you were on it. You need to fight. You need to push this crap out. You need to assert that the natural sciences fundamentally do something different. That what they produce is fundamentally different than knowledges broadly construed. You must fight this. If you want to know what radicalized me, though, it was this. I actually hope it radicalizes you, too. <laughs>